Okay, let's look at some of the examples they bring forward then. The first one is, uh, uh, we mentioned Imam al-Tahawi earlier on. In Aqidah al-Tahawiyah, he mentions, in point 78, we don't make takfir based on sins as long as the people don't make it halal. In point 94, he then goes on to say, we do not see it permissible to use a sword against anybody from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except the one who is obligatory to raise a sword against. Do you see the funny the joke here right now, the irony here? 78 you mentioned, and then 90 what? 94 What about the middle? Let's look at what's in the middle Abu Jafar al-Tahawi rahimahullah He says That's 78 yeah. That's 78 right? Yeah And then he says 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 والأمن والإياس ينقلان عن ملة الإسلام وسبيل الحق بينهما لأهل القبلة ولا يخرج العبد من الإيمان إلا بجحود ما أدخله الله ما أدخله فيه والإيمان هو هو الإقرار باللسان والتصديق بالجنان وأن جميع ما أنزل الله في القرآن وجميع ما صح عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من الشرع والبيان كله حق والإيمان واحد وأهل في أصل وأهل في أصله سواء والتفاضل بينهم بالخشية والتقى ومخالفة الهوى وملازمة الهؤلاء والمؤمنون كلهم أولياء الرحمن وأكرمهم عند الله أطواعهم أتبعهم للقرآن والإيمان هو الله يسأل والإيمان هو الإيمان بالله وملائكة وكتب ورسل واليوم الآخر والقدر خيره وشره وحلوه ومره من الله تعالى ونؤمن ونحن مؤمنون بذلك كله لا نفرق بين أحد من الرسل ونصدقهم كلهم على ما جاءوا به وأهل الكبائر من أمة محمد في النار لا يدخلون لا يخلدون إذا ماتوا وهم موحدون وإن لم يكونوا تائبين بعد أن لقوا الله عارفين مؤمنين خم في مشيئته وحكمه إن شاء غفر له لهم وعفى عنهم بفضله كما ذكر عز وجل في كتابه ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء وإن شاء عذبهم في النار بعدله ثم يخرجهم منها برحمته وشفاعة الشافعين من أهل طاعته ثم يبعثهم إلى جنته وذلك بأن الله تعالى تولى أهل معرفته ولم يجعلهم في الدارين كأهل نكرته الذين خابوا من هدايته ولم ينالوا من ولايته اللهم يا ولي الإسلام وأهله ثبتنا على الإسلام حتى نلقاك ونرى الصلاة خلف كل بر وفاجر من أهل القبلة وعلى من مات من منهم ولا ننزع ولا ننزل أحد منهم جن جنة ولا نارا ولا نشهد عليهم بكفر ولا بشرك ولا بنفاق ما لم يظهر منهم شيء من ذلك ونذر سرائرهم إلى الله تعالى ولا نرى السيف على أحد من أمة محمد إلا من وجب عليه السيف ولا نرى الخروج على أئمتنا وولاة أمورنا وإن جاروا ولا ندعو, ولا ندعو عليهم ولا ننزع يدا من طاعتهم What's funny and the irony is that even when this part was translated it was translated incorrectly ولا نرى الخروج على إمتنا. We do not. Oh, so I'm coming to that. It's point ninety five, right? Point ninety five is the one. Read that's the point. That ninety four is the one I mentioned. Ninety five, I haven't translated it yet. I'm coming to that. I mean, when it was when it was when it was portrayed, I just I need to explain it. Okay. ولا نرى الخروج على إمتنا. We do not do خروج on our leaders. وولاة أمورنا and the leaders in charge of us. وإن جاروا if they do transgression. ولا ندعو عليهم. We don't make dua against them. That's the correct translation. Hmm. Yani, what I I really want people to understand is that. If a person can't read uh, information in front of them, this is sitq, we have to really ponder and contemplate here. And it's not because they're being deceptive, I don't believe yani, necessarily. Yeah, yeah. But the ignorance has reached that level that a person can't even translate something in front of them. ولا ننزع يدا من طاعتهم ونرى طاعتهم من طاعات الله عز وجل فريضة ما لم يأمروا بمعصية وندعو لهم بالصلاح والمعافاة If a person can't translate this, I don't think anyone should trust information that a person submits to Allah the, the, So they did, they translated it We don't see it to be permissible to do khuruj against our imams Aye. and our leaders Aye. And even if they are oppressive, Aye. we don't call to this and we no, don't It doesn't say we don't call to this uh, see, That's my point you say that, ولا ندعو عليه means we don't make dua against them Okay, they said we don't call to this and we don't relinquish our hand from the obedience. But the point I'm really trying to draw home is that you spoke all of that Arabic that you mentioned <laughs> between 78, 78 and 0.94, which is talking about, or 0.95 is talking about the Mas'ala of Khuruj. And obviously there's a lot of English speakers at home who don't really fully understand what you said, but you talked about Iman in the six pillars, you talked about a range you know of how, you, know how, you know how many pages Ibn Abdul Izzan Hanafi explained all of that? How many? More than 40 pages. Just what comes between point seventy eight and point ninety four. Of course, it's a, it's, it's a lot of points. <laughs> and in English, just for the English speakers at home, you spoke to, spoke about. Let me be, can I can I just quickly look at Ibn Abdul Hanifi Sharah exactly how much numbers uh, Safha to can. be more accurate. You can like just just for people to know, yani, how many Safha had between that? 
I think let me just give some context for the people at home why you're doing that as well. So the the argument was that the put is put forward is that 0.78 yeah, is linked to 0.9495. And to say that, like I said before, when I was coming across this research, I genuinely don't believe it's through insincerity or intentionally trying to misguide people. But when I came across this, this really upset me because I don't really believe anybody can really think that, be sane on that. And actually, you know, especially when you look, you just read out all the points that came between 78 and 94, talked about so many different topics that I just don't believe anyone can really believe that 70, 0.78. I can't say it was 0.78 connected to 0.79. No, I can see where you're coming from. But to say 0.78 is connected to 0.95 and there's nothing wrong with doing khuruj unless you make takfir because that's what 0.78 mentioned. And you know what's funny? Um, that's upsetting. Even Arabic, like al lughatan the wow is atf. It's connected to everything that was mentioned before. I mean, wallahi, I mean, for me personally, ahlahu ma'mur. Both of them are as bad as each other. If you're deceptive and if you're ignorant, both of them are as bad as each other. And I honestly, wallahi, this is my sincere, honest, yani brotherly approach on all of this, is that some people, when they look at these issues, they think to themselves, you can't respond, you don't have the answers for all of this. Wallahi, sometimes it's not just about the answers. It's just, you don't know. I, I'm talking about myself. I don't like in any way, shape or form to really embarrass somebody and true, just bring this out like that. It's, I mean, no one's free from errors and mistakes. But I've never seen in my life, in my life, my course of my, in my life of da'wah and studying and teaching, this level yeah. of jura and a jura person's adamant like that and when you listen you find sakatat tasheefat tahreefat you you can't even listen to a one minute i haven't i've have watched the opponents what they have to say in this issue Wallahi, I haven't I sat down and listened to anything. I asked you to if get the if, yeah, yeah. all the shubhat for me, and we go through it like that. My heart can't give it to me because I just see yeah, I need the, yeah, the scholarly, yeah, I need what ruler man put behind, just being played around with, yeah. Yeah, I need, in that manner. But let's look at what Ibn Abi Al-Aziz and Hanafi said. I'm just, it's just I'm waiting for it to download and for it to come. Yeah, and we're talking about pages after pages after pages of. Information. Just, do you remember what number it was? The fir the first part. Seventy eight point seventy eight, okay. up until point ninety five is the one that mentioned khuruj specifically. And this, there's a reason why we specifically choose in Sharh Ibn Abi Al Hanafi. We believe it's one of the best shuruhat. Okay. So I'm using the tahqiq of Muasist al Risala by Sheikh Abdullah Ibn Abdul Muhsin al Turki's one. It's one of the best. Shaib al Naud and him did it together. It's the best uh, tahqiq to be honest. So we go to that particular point. So where where is it? What number is it again? Point seventy eight. So point number 78. And just, uh, just, just so they, what they say is that this doesn't uh, mean that khuruj against a Muslim ruler is wrong. It's only if it comes with this belief. To, I, 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 you know, even as I'm repeating it, uh, it's, it's just shocking. So what, what was the point 78? 78, yeah. So what was the point 78 talking about again? Making takfir based on sins. Sahih, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you have to find point ninety five, which mentions khuruj. And I have the kitab in two mujallads so this. this uh, I just need to check this one. Okay. Then, or just go to point ninety four, in fact, because that's the first one that they mentioned. Okay. So it was talking about. So the first one is the field of major sins. Second one is we don't. Um, 94, 95 mentions khuruj, but they mentioned 94 before that to do with we don't uh, raise a sword against anyone of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam unless it's a, unless it's obligatory to raise it against or something along those lines. But it's basically 94.94. So it's 16 points later. So what was the, is when uh, the Imam mentions the issue of takfir. Yeah, issue of takfir is 0.78. To 539, if you go to it by point number, if you go by 0.94. 94. If you go 95. It's 107 pages. Yeah. 107 pages between 432 yeah. to 539. That's how many pages between the two points. Yeah. Sharah. And they're all connected. To say that the only reason that they mentioned 0.94 is because of 0.78 and otherwise it doesn't stand on its own.
Of course, they can't butt their heads with all these books of Aqidah that mention these points. So many you know, khuruj, they have to come up with something. Okay. In, in between it is the issue of the yani, Arkanul Iman and etc. Yeah. Okay, I have to be fair and just. And there are other times where they do mention, again, the books of Aqidah, that's the topic that we're on. There are other times where they do mention uh, not making takfir on based on sins and then the issue of khuruj and they are next to each other. So again, like I've been doing all through the podcast, I'm reading everything. But what does that show if something's next to something? What does it really show? Yeah. It's like me saying, Antu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wa liyawmi al-akhiri wa tu'mina bil qadari khair wa sharri. Antu'mina bil qadari khair wa sharri. You know, it's close to... And you know... You still have to believe in all six. So if tak- main, we don't make takfir based on sins and we don't do khuruj, you have to believe in both. Anyway, let's go through it. In the book Masail of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, a man came to Imam Ahmed and asked him about the head of the matter of ijma' amongst the Muslims. So these are obviously extremely important issues that are going to be mentioned here. He starts by mentioning the importance of iman in, in the qadr, the good of it, the bad of it. He mentions iman is, iman is speech and action. It increases and decreases. He mentions we place Allah behind an imam even if he's a sinner. He mentions jihad with the sultan, i.e. the Muslim ruler. Then he man- mentions that we have patience under his banner and we do not rebel against him with the sword nor the stick. And immediately after that, he mentions, and we do not make takfir of anyone based on sins. So they say these things are connected together. Uh, look, if the person is saying that the reason why these things are mentioned each, next to each other is because Madhab al Khawarij is to go against the oppressive Muslim leader, I'm going to be like, yes. Yeah. Hey, nah. yes that's, you're right. That may, that's re- may be a reason why they put it there. Because Madhab al Khawarij is that they go against the oppressive Muslim leader. With, on top of that, the Khawarij have a belief which is that they make takfir on things are which are what? Laysa bi mukaffir. It's not, yani, ma laysa mukaffiran. That which is, you know, that which is not kufr. Yeah. Takfir. A takfir bi ma laysa mukaffiran. I can see where the base of you. But if you say that the only people see khuruj are the Khawarij because the ulama mentioned this next to each other, I'll be like, no. Imam Ahmad you're using here I mentioned the ijma' that he brought. And what did Ahmed say when the ijma' he brought? He didn't say, he said, فَمَنْ فَعَلَ ذَلِكَ Anyone who does this, فَهُوَ مُبْتَدِعٌ عَلَى غَيْرِ السَّبِيلِ وَالسُنَّةِ That this person is a mubtadi'. Hmm. He's not upon the path. He's not upon the sunnah. He said, mubtadi'. Ahmed made tabdi' of the person who does what? Khuruj, right? Yeah. Now I want you to understand. I believe, and I'm going to prove inshallah ta'ala as we go on, that the person who goes against the oppressive Muslim leader are three types. I'm going to prove that inshallah ta'ala. The first one is the khawarij. Who yes, they do takfir of the Mus- to the Muslims in things that which are not kufr. Yes, that's true. And I'm, it's true. And there's another group who don't do takfir. Hmm. But they see the permissibility of, of going against the oppressive Muslim leader. And they are who? They are? The Muqtadiyah. The Mubtadi'ah. The Mubtadi'ah, the innovators. Because I want to tell you something. The early Khawarij that came out at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, they didn't do takfir of every major sin. That wasn't a bit ahad khadi had. They just made takfir on one thing. Hukum bi ma anzala. They didn't do takfir of zina and khamar. That came after. Hmm. As that belief creeped into them later, they started to make principles for their belief. Do you understand my point? Yeah. Yani, so... To say that this is the only khawarij, just no. Then, uh, uh, just then the third group you said you said there's three groups. You mentioned the first two, and the third group is the bugat. Who, yes, without a shadow of a doubt, they are not khawarij and they are not mubtadi'ah, but they are rebels hmm. who do khuruj. All three of them do khuruj, but they're rebels. They're forts. And inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to talk about the differences yeah. in great details. Inshallah ta'ala. But I just need you to understand, Qutub al-Itiqad are dealing with the first two types. Yeah. They're dealing with the Khawarij and they're dealing with the Mubtadi'ah. Al-Hasan ibn Salih, they say he was a Mubtadi'ah, not a Khawariji. Mm. He wasn't a Khawariji, he was a Mubtadi'ah. Which shows there can be a difference between the two. Yeah, there, are, there, there, is, there is, there is. And that's, uh, that's important to know. And yeah, the way these are being used are basically saying that Khuruj is not impermissible. The only time it becomes impermissible is if you make, if you have this belief of making takfir of major sins because they're mentioned together. And we've dispelled this. But can I, can I, 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 this is where I start questioning things. I start thinking, yeah. things, you know, I start thinking, this doesn't make sense. And that is, you mentioned at the beginning of your discussion, you said to me, Abdurrahman, I believe it's, you're not allowed to do khuruj. 
So these statements that you're reading from these ulama, you need to be reading them and understanding that you're not allowed to do khuruj. Mm -hmm. All the evidence I brought, all the aqwal of the ulama I brought, you're going to be, you, sh you should be saying, yes, you're right, I believe that. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be questioning them. True. Because you believe khuruj is not allowed. Yeah. You're only going to dispute one thing in the whole uh, podcast. That is an ijma' or that that's is all you're, But if I see you questioning the ahadiths, weakening the ahadiths, if I see you saying that this hadith is weak, or if I see you saying this scholar didn't say this, or that scholar didn't say this, or Imam Ahmed's statement meant this, or Al Imam Al Harb al Kirmani's statement meant, and you dismantle all of the evidence that prohibits khuruj, then why do then I how did you come to the conclusion that there's, you can't do khuruj? Unless really. Unless really you don't believe khuruj is not allowed. Mm. Okay. Carrying on, in Sheikh Rabi al Madhali's Sharh of Aqid to Raziyain, point 21 mentions we don't make takfir of the people of the Qibla based on their sins. Point 23 mentions we don't see khuruj to be permissible against the Imams. I'm just bringing them all, even though we've, it's repetitive and we've mentioned them all. The statement of Imam Ahmed in the Surah Sunnah, he mentions the issue of khuruj and how it is oppos in opposition to the narrations for, of the, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the ijma' of the Muslims. This is a narration that you're bringing, I think. Okay. He says, it is not permissible for anybody to fight the, the Sultan or do khuruj against him. And whoever does, this is a mubtadi' and who is upon a path other than the Sunnah. So what did this, so what's, what's, what's take, what, this is it's good. coming now, and it's good so far. Hey? Immediately after this, he says, fighting the khawarij and the thieves is permissible. So what does that show? Yeah. It shows the two parties here. <laughs> yeah. It supports my argument. They say there's muqtadi'a yeah. and there's a khawarij. They say the fact that the word khawarij was, was mentioned straight after muqtadi'a. Because they could do khuruj as well. Means that it's connected. It means that the khawarij, they do khuruj. But they're not, they're not, they don't only just do khuruj. They make, they do khuruj with takfir. Mm. That's their premise. But there's another party of people who do khuruj without making takfir. Yeah. And then the mubtadi'a, again, al-hasal ibn salih ibn hay. Final one I've got. Ali al-Madini also has a very similar narration same, to, same to the thing. one we just mentioned. He says, we do not rebel against the Muslim ruler. And anybody who does that has opposed the athar of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and dies a death of jahiliya. It is not permissible for anybody from the people to do khuruj. Anybody from the people, it says. Ah. <laughs> Not possible for anybody from the people to do khuruj. It doesn't say that. It depends on their intention or anything. It doesn't. And whoever does that, he is an innovator in opposition to the sunnah. Hey, an innovator, uh, that's a group, hey? Yeah, and then right after he mentioned that it is permissible to fight the khawarij and the thieves. Yes. Yani the khawarij are the ones who do khuruj with what? With takfir. They do, their khuruj is not just, he's a valim, I'm going against him. For example, I believe the opponents right now, their view is not the view of the Khawarij. Because they're not saying, I'm leaving this ruler because he did, they're not making takfir on him yeah. by saying he did a major sin. That's not the Khawarij opinion. The Khawarij, they make takfir on, yani, with them be with sins that are not kufr, that haven't reached the level of kufr. And then they do, then they do khuruj. This is their base. Yeah. Like in the Mubtadi'a, the innovators that Ahmed mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Ali ibn Nadini mentions, they're the ones who say what? It's permissible for you to go against oppressive Muslim leader. That person is not a khariji. I know he's not. He's a mubitadiyah. Because yeah. he's not doing takfir aslan. Yeah. And I'm going to expand on that, inshallah ta'ala. I'm going to bring the scholars who said this. Yeah, it's coming very soon, inshallah. Finally, thing that they say, uh, which is strange because when I went through the material, it's pretty much full of quotes from scholars, from scholars and nothing else, as we've seen, quotes mm -hmm. from scholars, quotes from scholars, all I've been bringing so far. They say, finally, even if these imams did make these statements, mm -hmm. they are not binding upon the ummah. They're so, not khujah, which we agree with. We've said many times, but it's, it's, it's very ironic. Okay, that is the issue of the books of Tiqad that we went through and the different statements there. Now I want to go on to the topic of uh, whether anybody who rebels is by default a khariji, mubtadi'ah, what is your what is your belief about this? You mentioned it a bit. Go into it a bit okay, more. Okay, now go into There's three groups. Okay. Let me start with the first two main groups that we've been discussing uh, mainly. The first one is un, the one, first one I know is known as the Bugat. And the Bugat are the people who are rebellious. Rebellious. They are by the way, all of these groups they do khuruj. Okay. But they do it in different ways with different mo motives and different mindsets. The Bugat they have two things which are distinct for them. I'm going to mention what is distinct and I'm going to mention what they all have in common. Fine. So the first group are the Bugat. Okay. The Bugat are those who, uh, they are annahum ahlul haq. They are ahlul haq. And the, st and the proof, ahlul haq, meaning they are 
asking for what is their haq. That's what it means. Haq. It doesn't mean they're the people of the truth. No. That they're doing a good thing. Ahlul Haq. Ahlul doesn't mean they're upon the truth. It just means what they are yani, f- demanding and what they want is right. They've been wronged. They've been oppressed. They're asking, they want their rights. That's what they are. They're okay. Ahlul Haq. But I have to ask you, how do you understand that? Because Ahlul Haq can also mean the people of the truth, can it not? No, what do you mean? Like, they, Ahlul Haq. So why does Allah tell us to fight with them? Why does Allah wa ta'ala, and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the ijma' of the ummah and the scholars is that we fight with these people? I'm going to go into this. Okay. They are Ahlul Haq, inshallah, meaning what they are asking for is legit. It doesn't pose what the Sharia. For example, the government is just cutting the electricity. They're not giving them their rights. There's, yeah, and they're being starved. The, 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 etc. That's the first thing. Okay. Second thing, second reason is and the sabab, and the is dunyawi. They're worldly reasons. They don't have those. Qal Allah, qal Rasul. These are bugat. Okay. The first reason that anhum ahlu haq Ibn Qudama mentions it, rahimahullah ta'ala, the 10th volume, page 46, he mentions it. The second one, which is that the, the sabab of the khurujna is worldly reason. Na, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions it in his kitab, Minhaj al-Sunan Nabuya, the 5th volume, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, page 153, I think. Okay. And Ibn Hazmin also mentions it in his muhalla, the 11th volume, page 333. That's the bugat. And then we have the khawarij. What are the khawarij? I want you to understand this one. The khawarij, like in, they believe with conviction the aqidatul khawarij. They have the belief of the khawarij, which is the main view of the khawarij is uh, they believe a takfir to label and dispel and disassociate a person from the religion of al Islam, bima laysa mukafiran, that which is not kufur. As Ibn Qudama mentions, he says, Al Khawariju Al Yukafiruna Bidambi. They make takfir based on a sin. Also, uh, he mentions in his Kitab al Mughni, he said, Wa ida adhara qawmun ra'ya al Khawarij, mithla takfir manir takaba kabira. Zarkashi, he mentions, Al Khawarij Al Ladina Yukafiruna Bidambi. So they made, Nawawi Rahimullah said, Al Khawariju sinfun min al Mubitadi'ah. I like to, you need to know this. The Khawarij are a type of the innovators. يعتقدون, they believe أن من فعل كبيرة كفر وخلد في النار and the person is in hell fire forever and Ibn Taymiyyah has a long discussion regarding them they're the ones that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said يقتلون أهل الإسلام ويدعون أهل الأوثان they kill the Muslims and they are يعني ones who leave the idol worshippers and disbelievers that they, they, their harm is directed towards the Muslims ISIS and Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab and all of these are khawarij that's the first belief they have. Second thing is istihlalu dima al muslimina wa amwalihim. They make halal for themselves, as I mentioned the hadith. They make halal for themselves the blood of the Muslims. Yaqtuluna ahl al Islam wa yadauna ahl al awthan. The hadith mentions it. They kill the Muslims and um, they see the bloods of the Muslims permissible and they leave the disbelievers. Rather, they will say that killing you is my first priority. I have to deal with you first. Okay? Hmm. The fact this is the uh, this belief go to Shaykh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah's Minhaj as Sunan Nabawiya, Amma Majmu' Al Fatawa specifically, go to Ibn Taymiyyah's Majmu' Al Fatawa, the 19th volume, page 73. Go to Fatul Bari, the 12th volume, page 285. That's what they have, uh, yani each one has separately. The Bugat, this is what they are, and the Khawarij. What about the Mubtadi'a? The Mubtadi'a are those who do khuruj. Hmm. They may physically go and do khuruj, and they may not do it. Lacking their brace is not the view of the khawarij. Okay. They don't believe what the khawarij believe. They, might, they don't make takfir of these leaders, and they don't make takfir of the people, and they don't use halal and dima al muslimin and they don't believe that. They just hold the opinion that going against an oppressive Muslim leader is permissible. Hmm. Religiously permissible. Religiously permissible. Does that make sense? Yeah. Religiously it's permissible and they come with kalam here or there. These are the mubtadi'a. This is the ones that Shaykh al-Islam uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah was talking about in his, uh, sorry, Shaykh al-Islam, uh, sorry, Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Hanbal and Ali ibn al-Madin, which we're going to come to. I'm going to come to what, what they said. There are characteristics, they are mushtarak. They share both parties. The Bugat, Khawarij, share. Also the mubtadi'a. All three of them share this. Mm. The first one is al-baghyu. They transgress. 
They, they're all Bugat in the sense where they're all rebels. They're yeah. all going out. Understood. Second thing is all of them are doing khuruj. Mm-hmm. Third, wujud well, tawbah. Not just do khuruj, but see the permissibility of khuruj. Of khuruj, yes. Yeah. Because even the khawarij may not do it. Yes. Because it's khawarij al qadiyah they might sit back. The Like in the Bugat, they will do it. They will do it, yeah. yeah. The Bugat can't just... Because it's not a religious thing for the It's Bugat. not a religious thing. Yeah. The Bugat will do it. Okay. The uh, third type is wujud al Interpretation is there. Everyone has his interpretation. One is a religious interpretation, one is a worldly interpretation. The Bugat, they have a ta'wil which is sa'ir, a valid yani, interpretation. Then you've got the fourth type, which is a hamlu silah, they take weapons. And sorry, just because you say they've got a valid interpretation, doesn't mean the act that comes after uh, that is Yeah, valid. they're going to be fought. Yeah. They're going to be fought. Yeah. The fourth thing that is hamlu silah, they all take weapons. And the fifth one is al imtina' an ta'atil imam, they refuse the obedience of the imam. These are five things they all have in common. Okay? Mm. All of them are fought. Fighting with all of them is... is, is, yeah, and is, is, is the, so now I want you to understand something. When we look at this issue of Bugat and Khawarij and the Mubtadi'ah, there's two things that we need to look at. The first thing is we need to, we need to look at the sifat, the characteristics. And I mentioned that to you now. Characteristics of each one. What they unique in and what they share. I fin- I've done that for you. There's something else that you need to know, which is Shurutu Qitalihim. What's the condition of fighting them? Okay. When you see the ulama talk about the Bugat, those are the two main points they're focusing on. They try to distinguish and identify one from the other. Okay? If you want to read more into this issue, you can go to the Fatwa al Qadir, the sixth volume, page 99 to page 100. Hmm. Bahrul Ra'iq, page 5, the, volume, the first, fifth volume, page 151. You can go to the Dakhira, which is the twelfth volume, page 5. You can go to Tajul Iklil, which is the sixth volume, page 378. You can go to the Rawdha to Talibin, the 10th volume, page 50. You can go to Minhaj al Talibin, page 1, 131. You can go to the Mughni by Ibn Qudama, the 10th volume, uh, page uh, 46. And you can go to the Muhallad ibn Hazmin, the 11th volume, page 33. Page 333. I want you to understand, I just gave you the four madhabs and the Zahiri madhab. Hmm. All of them I've given you a book, or at least two. Uh, you can go to at least one book in each madhab. That you could go to Hanafiyyah, Malikiya, Shafi'iyah, and Hanabila. And Ibn Hazmin. And, and then I told you Ibn Hazmin, who's a Zahiri, where you can find what he said. In other words, what I'm trying to show you, this is the view that, that's been mentioned by them. So what did I just tell you now? I told you and I explained to you. And then the teacher that we reached here is that there are sifat which are khas for the Bugat. And there's characteristics which is khas for the Khawarij. And there's characteristics which are khas for the Mubtadi. Khas means specific. I mentioned that, right? Yes. And I also mentioned the sifat which are yashtarikuna fi sifat. They, ca- they share a, a few of characteristics. Al-baghyu, al-khuruju, wujudu ta'wil, hamlu silah, al-imtina' and ta'ati al-imam. They all share this, this. The question here is, so we now finish the characteristics, right? Yeah. Now we're going to go into what are the shurut for us to fight them. Okay. Okay, when is the, yani that it becomes permissible to fight them. So let's talk about this second, this is the second thing. They mention characteristics which they all share for us to fight them. First of all, it has to be uh, the land has to be Daru Islam. It has to be a land of the Muslims. Okay, that they go in, they, they're okay. doing this in. Number two is Ayakuna Lahum Mana'ah. That they have force, they have power. Now, Kathara or Biquwa, this is not agreed upon. The Maliki don't believe all of that. That the Kathara and the Quwa and all of that and and it doesn't it, if it's a lot if it's little Maliki don't they, they, that's, that's a shart that they don't take like that but Jumhur they, they distinguish it. the fourth one is an يخرج عن قبضة الإمام they have to leave the, the grab of the Imam they rebel out of they go out outside him okay that's the fourth these are characteristics the fifth one is أن يكون لهم تأويل there has to be interpretation they have okay those five is a condition they mention where it makes it permissible to fight them. Okay, there's quite, there's conditions that are specific for the khawarij. Shurut mm. that are conditioned for the khawarij, dun al bugat, not the bugat. Okay, and there's also uh, uh, characteristics, uh, sorry, conditions that are specific for the bugat, not necessarily for the for the khawarij. I mean, there are characteristics which we say this is specific to them, and this is. That now that's not agreed upon by the ulama. I mean, all the ulama don't I mean, take those I mean, characteristics that, as uh, as binding. 
So you can find it in Madani al-Kutub, uh, in the books of fiqh and kutub al uh, that I mentioned, the references that I uh, gave now. Okay, so to summarize then, what you're saying is that anybody who makes khuruj, or in the case of the khawarij and the mubtadi'ah, who sees the permissibility of khuruj, even if they don't do it themselves, they're actually broken down into three groups of people. Mm-hmm. One is the khawarij, and this group, they actually make takfir of the rulers based mm-hmm. on sins, and then as a result, they do khuruj based on that. Aina. The second one is mubtadi'ah, who don't make take fear of the rulers they say they're muslim oppressive rulers but they still believe it's permissible to do khuruj against them mm-hmm. and the third group is the bugat who is not even a deen issue it's not even like a, a, a religious issue they just want to get their right for the dunya dunya things that they're after and as a result of that they do khuruj mm-hmm. against the ruler okay have you ever said that by default the one who does khuruj is a khariji no, not always. I just mentioned it now. That's but in previous less lectures or anything, I don't know if you... No, I do say that because a lot of the people I've come across, I say it because of the fact that I met a lot of people who basically say it's takfir. But in the tahqiq, you see, there's things that you say when you're teaching the kutub al-i'tiqad because a lot of the people, they're saying they're kuffar, so we can go against them. I've Honestly speaking, I haven't seen this like this mindset, this jura hmm. that I've seen now. Somebody mm. saying, I'm not saying they're kuffar. Hey. But still believe it's Muslims. Hey, yeah. Mm. And you do, you do khuruj on them. Uh, this is, for me personally, in the course of my life in da'wah like this, yani in the English language I'm talking about, I've yeah. seen it in the Arab world, but in the English language, I haven't seen someone come out like this mm. to say that you can do khuruj up against an oppressive Muslim leader on the grounds that he's a Muslim. I'm not even saying he's a kafir. Yeah. So when I'm talking to that person, I'm going to be like, okay, now we have to we have to break this issue down. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not doing tak- no, I'm not doing takfir. I've been over the years I've been dealing with people who were making takfir of the yeah. Muslim leaders. Saying kafir, kuffar, all of them, qatibat, bidun istithna, they're kuffar, la yuminuna billahi wa la bil yawm al-akhir. Aqfaru min al-yahud wa nasara people like that. <laughs> so those type of people, we know that their belief is yani in line with the khawarij. In line with what? The khawarij, so we dealt with them as, as we deal with the khawarij. And yeah. We mentioned those evidences to yeah. them and we will label them as khawarij. Yeah. Like there's this new movement which is, not only am I, are they saying that uh, you, you, you can go against an oppressive Muslim leader, uh, they're, saying, uh, يعني, they're saying it's a valid difference of opinion. Or they, they, they're, they're saying, يعني, I'm seeing a group of people actually saying that you can. There's also a group of people saying, no, you don't. You can't do khuruj uh, uh, with a oppressive Muslim leader. But... Uh, it's, it's 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 valid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we shouldn't go inkar masail ijtihadiya la inkar fi masail ijtihad. Yeah. So those people, I will say, calling the khawarij and the tahqiq is not valid. Uh, what seems to be strong with ilmu and Allah and knowledge is Allah is that you say these are mubtadi'ah. Yeah. Uh, their view is ibtida'ah. Okay. Uh, no. The good thing is we don't need to go through. I mean, they've got a lot of statements here. But what's happened is that the other side who are holding the position that I'm representing today um, they actually didn't realize that you separated it in three different groups. They just assumed that you are saying that anybody who believes khuruj is permissible, I think one of the, they're either saying one of two things, and I'm not 100% sure myself. Either they're saying you believe he's an automatic khadiji, or they're saying he, you believe he's an automatic innovator, which might be true if you're talking about the context of the deen. But they brought a lot of statements about Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn mm-hmm. Qudam al Maqtizi, the same statements you brought, mentioning the Bugat and saying how the ulama actually made a difference. But of course, and this is why a conversation is almost better to have these kind of things because you can clear these up things hey, up in minutes. So minutes, minutes. Whereas what's actually happened is that hour long videos have been made based on this. That, 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 see, that's what I'm saying. That statement of there being that group is clear in Ahmed's statement when he said, Waman kharaja ala imamin min muslimina. وقد كانوا اجتمعوا عليه وأقروا له بالخلافة بأي وجه كان بالرضا أو الغلب فقد شق هذا الخارج عسى المسلمين وخالف الآثار عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فإن مات الخارج عليه مات ميتة جاهلية ولا يحل قتال السلطان لكري سيز ولا الخروج عليه لأحد من الناس لكري سن أفتلا فمن فعل ذلك anyone who goes against the oppressive Muslim leader فهو هل يسهي فهو خارجي سن فهو مبتدع هي مبتدع غير and he's on a path other than the path of the sunnah. Hmm. So he's a mubtadi'ah. There's that group that exists. They're, they're called the mubtadi'ah. So the first people are those man yukafiruhu bi kabira, major sins they make takfir of him. Khawarij. So there's a khari, we call them to those kharijis. And there are those people who religiously believe yani, that it's permissible to go against an oppressive leader because of his fisq. Bila takfir, without any takfir, fa yubadda wa yudallal. 
those are considered mubtadi'a and misguided people is they're warned against but they are not khawarij like al hasan ibn salih sufyan authority did that to hasan ibn salih uh, al imam ahmad did the same to al hasan ibn salih zaid ibn qudamah did that to al hasan ibn salih they didn't make t- 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 they didn't say see him as a khariji he wasn't a khariji to them he was a mubtadi'a to them mm. and there's that third group which is li hadhin dunyawi these are the when well, they go for worldly reasons butter and bread they strike because the, they want their salary sal- yani they're busting striking and everything and they do khuruj and they rebel and they take their weapons and they fight and they loot and wa hakada these are bugat rebels yeah yeah those are the three types of people and they're still wrong just to clarify when we say they've got a valid ahlul haq they're valid they've got a valid thing that they're fighting for for example let's get rid of racism it doesn't mean that khuruj as a result of that is uh, valid no. it's still wrong they no. should still be for okay um so Uh, so don't you think to yourself that the fight is restricted to the Khawarij mm. so All three, part, three parties are fought I've got an interesting question then What do you say about the fourth group Because you mentioned three groups The one who believes makes takfir based on sins And then there's khuruj The one who believes khuruj is permissible The one who is not really related to the deen It's just dunya issue hey. The fourth group now is the one I'm representing on this podcast They don't believe khuruj is permissible hey. But they believe there's a valid ikhtilaf They mubtada or what would you say about them? You see, when I mention these issues, I'm first of all speaking generally. Ah, Fulan is a mubtadi and Alan is a mubtadi. I'm not doing that. Mm. I'm just mentioning a general ruling that any single person who believes, general student, like, any, like I say, anyone who leaves the salah is careful. I know many people don't pray the salah. They don't do sujood mm. unless they fall on the floor. They don't prostrate to Allah Ta'ala. Now, am I doing takfir? No, I'm not taking takfir on them. Hukum am and hukum khasim. There's a general am Specific, يعني, you fulan are a mubtadi. That's another discussion for. Plus, it's not even my place, Aslan. So I don't entertain that idea. I won't entertain it uh, because I don't need to go around and say takafir mubtadi, kafir mubtadi, not Aslan. Hmm. Like when I spe- generally speak, I'm speaking like Ahmed spoke. For man fa'ala dalika, for who mubtadi on, and anyone who does this, he's a mubtadi and he's upon the path other than the path of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. So this view that has been pushed um, that there's valid difference of opinion. I'm very skeptical of this view personally. I'll be honest with you. I'm very skeptical of this whole push because you can't be insulting the people who are saying on the other side there's no valid difference of opinion. Mm. If and you believe what they believe yeah. like the end result is the same you actually yeah, believe what they believe. Yeah, because what you're do- what you're and, doing and, yeah. doing is you're saying these oppressive Muslim leaders should be be we have to be patient on them and let us accept their uh, yani oppression by being patient. Yani a, But then you're insulting those people by saying you're taking. And do you understand my point? You're, yeah. You're, you're bit, Slaves are the rulers. So I'm questioning whether that the, the the view is valid, validly held on to. Question is very questionable. Yeah. You're weakening all the narrations, or you're weakening this narration. You're dismissing the aqwal of the ulama. You're you're bringing this to the amatun nas. And even if I believe today there's a valid difference of opinion for niqab not being wajib, I can't really argue for it because I don't believe it. Yeah. And even yeah. if I, I do, I believe that niqab is a valid difference of opinion, right? Yeah. But I don't even know how to start debating for it. Because every time I'm going to feel in my head, yeah, it is this not strong. Yeah. Because I don't believe it to be valid. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So um, I'm just going to go through these, skip through these statements. So because it, some people, so, so these khawarij who, yani, Imam uh, Malik used to believe that the khawarij, Malik, he, had a, he held a, pu- a belief uh, regarding the ibadiyah, they're a type of khawarij. He believed they were asked to be re- repented. They were to be told repent. If they don't repent, Imam Malik believed that they will be killed. Rahimahullah ta'ala. He used to say, Ishaq ibn, Ismail ibn Ishaq, and he said, رأى مالك قتل الخوارج وأهل القدر من أجل الفساد الداخل في الدين كقطاع الطريق فإن تابوا إلا قتلوا على إفسادهم لا على كفرهم. They're not, not killed because they're disbelievers. No. Okay, uh, I'm just going to skip through these statements because these are the statements that they bring forward. But of course, there's no uh, there's no contradiction between what you're saying and they're saying. Really, it's just a misunderstanding, and as a result, there's uh, a huge mess occurred. But they say Kitab al Furu' ibn Muflih, Sheikh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah said the majority of the ulama distinguish between the Khawarij and the Bughat while making an interpretation exactly the same as you just said. They're both going out against the ruler, but the ulama make a distinction, and this was known amongst the Sahaba and the Imams from the people of the Hadith. No issue, you've already said that. In Muqdam al-Maqtasi mentions al mughni this is a statement I think you were bringing, those who rebel against the ruler are broken down into four groups. So he said four groups actually. The first group is the highway robbers who commit corruption on earth. The second group are those who rebel with ta'wil, i.e. based on interpretation. The third group is the khawarij who make takfir based on major sins, and they may take fear of Uthman, Ali, and many of the companions, and they make the blood and the wealth of the Muslims halal, 
And then the fourth group are a group from the people of truth, Ahlul Haq. They rebel against the Imam. So these uh, one he's saying, which is Wal Kharijun and Qabdat al Imani Asnaf al Arbaat when he's saying, yeah. Yeah. Then after he said Tumma Kal, a sin for Rabia. He said, Qomun min ahli al Haq, Yahrujun and Qabdat al Imam Sah. ويرومون خلعه لتأويل سائغ وفيه مناعة يحتاج في كفيم إلى جميع الجيش فهؤلاء البغاة الذين نذكر في هذا الباب حكمهم وواجب على الناس معونة إمام في قتال البغاة لما ذكرنا في أول الباب ولأنهم لو تركوا معونته لقهر أهل البغي وظهر الفساد في الأرض So this is exactly what I was mentioning that the bugat are what أهل الحق yeah. Second thing is what the سبب of their خروج is what worldly reasons like He didn't mention that they are worldly reasons but I already told you who who mentioned that the the call is wrong Ibn Taymiyyah mentions it yeah. and also Ibn Hazm in his muhalla yeah and the, and if they're trying to cling on to the statement ahlul uh, haq the people of truth then it obviously can't be the people of truth because we've been told to fight them as well ha, so what me, what it means that the ahlul haq is mean they, they, what they're asking for is their rights yeah and that's another huge misunderstanding like in the khawarij and the uh, and the, the, the mubtadi'a know their premise is wrong yeah. they're not haq how are they upon haq make takfir of a muslim bi bidanbin you're not upon haq the mubtadi'ana they're not upon haq you're not allowed to do khuruj on a person being been fasiq so it's really a proof ahl haq here is actually a proof against the people I who know. believe there's been misquote but they actually use it as a proof for them saying how can people who do khuruj be from the people of truth but, okay um okay after that we have uh imam nawi in his role the talibin the baghi is the one who opposes a just ruler and disobeys him by staying away from what is obligatory upon him or other than him he goes on to say the Baghi is not to be criticized and he is not sinful and you don't mention them with any kufr because they are mistaken in what they do because of their ta'wil. Mm -hmm. they, so they're not kufar, of course they're not yeah. kufar. Okay, so Neither of the three groups are kufar, all of them are Muslims. Yeah. Khawarij Zohar, you believe that, yeah? The strongest opinion is that they're Muslims. Okay, okay so um, again, that was just really a misunderstanding that occurred, I believe, that they thought that you were saying every person who rebels is automatically a khadiji. And you that you didn't even recognize the Bugat out there, and they wanted to show you that. But again, could have been very easily clear, uh, cleared up if um, a conversation took place between the two parties. But that's where we are now. Next thing I want to talk about is protesting in a Muslim country. Okay. Is this allowed? Uh, no, it's khuruj. I told you. It's, it's because so it's... protesting is part of khuruj. What if someone says that I'm not trying to uh, overthrow the Muslim ruler? I'm not even trying to make khuruj or disobey him. I'm just raising awareness. I'm just letting him know that this law that he's made, I'm not too happy with it. And what other way can we let him know? So what was the Prophet So I'm going to respond in four ways. Okay. The first one is that it's muqalifu lil adillati wa ijma' al salafi. So it goes against the adilla that I mentioned before and the ijma' of the salaf, which was what? To be patient upon the oppressive Muslim leader. That statement was used, patience. Mm. And what does the word patient mean in, mean in the Arabic language? It means al-imsak, is to withhold. So you, you refrain, you withhold yourself. That's number one. Number two, it is that there is a, I already spoke about, there is a tariqa shara'iya fi munasahat al-hukam. There's a san sanctioned way to give advice to the leader. Mudaharat is not from those things. To go out there in public and then speak about him and mention his faults and mistakes. We already mentioned the hadith that we authenticated, the hadith, Iyad ibn Ghanmin, which was, Iman arad an yansah hadithi sultani fala yubdi lahu alaniyah. Hadith ibn Abi Asim mentions, in his Kitab al-Sunnah, we authenticated it, right? That anyone who wants to advise the leader, go and advise him privately. And Alhamdulillah, there are many channels now, you can send the letters to them. And if they read it, Alhamdulillah, if not, Qadarullah ma sha'a fa'al. Adayta alladhi alayhi, the Prophet said, if you've done your part. Uh, the third response I want to give is, inshaAllah ta'ala, is that this is a path lam yatakhidha al-salafu. The salaf, salaf, salaf al-salaf did not take when there was the need for it to do mudaharat. They never took that part. Not the, so it's not like someone who says, there's a there's an ikhtilaf which is sa'ikh because the salaf did khuruj. That's their premise. Yeah, yeah. And here, if you're going to be consistent and take what the salaf did, yeah, yeah. there is no, no salaf made doing protests or anything well, like at that. At all. And rather, these people who are asking this question or arguing this, they're already using religious reasons. So they're trying to get closer to Allah by doing the protest, it seems, from their discussion. So this falls under bid'ah, which is you're, you're doing... Uh, a, a wasila that the Prophet did not sanction, the pious predecessors did not do. do. Well, the need for it was there. When tafal mani, and the preventive factor is absent, yeah, so the Sahabs could have done it. It's not like microphone they couldn't have done. True. Something they could have done. Yeah. The need for it that you're saying was also there at that Correct. time. Yeah. But they chose not to do it. If you do it, it's innovation. Yeah. And that, guy, that is a very important point to understand. Last but not least, it's a means to corruption and anarchy. And, you know, Zazaatul Amn. It's to really, really bring stability in the land and to cause, you know, havoc, which happens in many lands. When the Mudaharat started, I don't need to go into 
the supposed Arab Spring that was done, how it all started off, and how many people were killed. And you know, go online, just go YouTube and watch yeah. women talking about their incidents of what happened to them and what was done to them and how they were harmed. Yeah. And, and also maybe a fifth thing I'd add, add on to that is that there are certain things that are connected to protests that can't be removed from the certain things that go against the Ain't Sharia. Not. And Ain't we not. talked about this and we spoke about this in great detail. I think if my memory serves me correctly, the podcast was called How to Rectify a Society. But we were talking about protests in the non-Muslim lands. Yeah, so yeah, I, I want you to understand a, a non-Muslim land, we can't use the Hadith of Sabr and the Ijma. Yeah. We don't, in the land of the non-Muslims, that, that doesn't exist. We weren't commanded to obey to a non-Muslim where they're only by, uh, in those countries with a contract a hud, a mawathiq and that's what we come from that, from yeah, that perspective yeah. you sign a contract the contract is the visa that you use when you come into the country mm. so be a law-abiding citizen by doing what you know is you know in this country as long as it doesn't go against your religion if it does just ignore it now that's like in the reason why we said it's haram in the non-Muslim lands is because of other factors, like the concept of ikhtilat and the concept of, you know, other maharim yes, and muharramat yes, that yeah. are done. And if the person is trying to get closer to Allah by these mudaharat, la shaka, it's an innovation. Yeah. Like in the lands of the non in the land of the Muslims, there's many reasons why it's haram. Number one, it goes against the evidence that command us to be patient. Mm. As sabr, this was the statements that the Prophet ﷺ used, to be patient. And this goes against patience. Yes. Naturally being patient upon something, a law that's passed you don't like. Patience means you yeah. don't try and change it. You don't try. And, and then after that, the Sharia has sanctioned how to advise him. If you do feel like you want to advise him yeah. and you feel like injustice is, be, is being done here, there's ways that the Sharia has san sanctioned for you. That tariq shari'ah, you go and you take that path. Mm -hmm. This path is not from the path that the Sharia has sanctioned for you. I'm, I'm only just saying to you, follow what Allah and his messenger sanctioned. It's as simple as that. And if you feel like you're going to do this to try and get closer to Allah, then it becomes innovation because it wasn't done by the Salaf al-Salih and it had the ability to do it and the, and the, um, the time called for it as well. Okay, the next thing I want to mention, um, and again, many of these that we've mentioned today are actually things that have not even brought out in the English world. You actually, These are actually things that have been brought out in the Arab world or in other books, but we mentioned just in case people start to mention them. We want to make this as comprehensive as possible. Uh, the companions radiallahu anhum said to Umar radiallahu anhu, by Allah, this is when he was taking the khilafah, by Allah, if we see from you an issue that we reject, we will stand against you with our swords. To which I believe Umar replied, all praise for Allah, the one who made in the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one who will straighten Umar with his sword. So this indicates that the companions believed that we could straighten the ruler with our swords and Umar Approved it. So this narration that you mentioned, where it says, يعني, يعني, the, the Umar, I entered upon Umar, في داره, هو, يعني, uh, I mean, this, the, the one I came across was that. Like the one they, they mentioned is that he, they said to him, Wallahi, لو رأينا منك أمرا ننكره لقومناك بحد السيوفنا. Uh, so this statement, which is بحد السيوفنا, mm. we would strengthen you, we would, Umar, we will strengthen you by the edges of our swords. I will straighten you, like straighten yeah, you. straighten you. Yeah. We will make sure you're you're upright you're by the end. I haven't seen that particular version. Okay, I haven't found it sahih or da'if that wording. So if so, the person, other people can prove it, it will be nice. And yeah, I haven't come across this sahih or da'if. Okay. I haven't seen it sahih or da'if. But what I've seen is the hadith of Hudayfa where he said I, I entered upon Umar. Okay, Hudayfa's one where he said I entered upon Umar, and when I entered upon him. Uh, when he was sitting uh, and I said to him uh, what he said to him and then after that he said to him uh, Umar radiallahu anhu he said to him قُلْتُ الَّذِي يَهُمُكَ وَاللَّهِ لَوْ رَأَيْنَا مِنْكَ أَمْرًا نُنْكِرُهُ لَقَوَّمْنَاكَ that's, that's it it's not بِحَدِّ سُيُوفِنَا that word is not in there okay what does it mean in English it just means we're gonna we're going to make sure that we keep you upright Umar the one that you mentioned is that بِحَدِّ السُّيُوفِنَا With our swords was mentioned. Mm -hmm. Like here it just says لَقَوَّمْنَاكَ We will just keep you upright, Umar. So this is a bit different from the other one because now it's not sword. It can be نَصِيحَة نَصِيحَة التَّقْوِيمُ بِالنَّصِيحَة And we take a shari way to, to correct you. So that's a, a point that I, inshallah ta'ala, and want. Also, the riwaya uh, that says حَدِّ السُّيُوفِنَا Okay. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I can think of now, yeah. Okay. Um, the next one is it is permissible to rebel with a sword due to the hadith 
whoever strives against them with his hands. This is for man jahadahum biyadihi fahuwa mu'min. This is part of a hadith. Whoever strives against them with his hand is a believer. Maybe you have the full hadith with you, I'm not sure. So the, the, you're, you're talking about the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. May Allah be pleased with him. Ibn, ibn Batta mentions it right in Ilbanat al-Kubra. Mm. And in there it says, لم يكن نبي قط إلا كان له من أمته حواريون وأصحاب يتبعون أمره ويهتدون بسنته ثم يأتي من بعد ذلك أمراء يقولون ما لا يفعلون يفعلون ما لا يؤمرون يغيرون السنن ويظهرون البدع فمن جاهدهم بيده فهو مؤمن ومن جاهدهم بلسانه فهو مؤمن ومن جاهدهم بقلب فهو مؤمن وليس وراء ذلك من الإيمان مثقال حبة خردل so the part that you want from it is فَمَنْ جَاهَدَهُمْ بِيَدِهِ Anyone who does jihad with these umara. Yeah, I can give the context, read the English translation okay. if you want me to. Yeah. Never has a prophet been sent before me by Allah to his people, but he had among his people disciples and companions who followed his ways and obeyed his command. Then there came after, from, after them their successors who proclaimed what they did not practice and practiced what they were not commanded to do. And whoever strove against them with his hand is a believer. And whoever strives against them with his heart is a believer, and whoever strove against them with his tongue is a believer, and beyond that there is no grain of faith. So here what we can take from this is that um, the hadiths, they explain one another. And the evidences and the proofs they meant to support one another. And we mentioned the ijma' that the ulama transmitted, that it's haram to do khuruj ala sultan. So this hadith, we will take it as uh, doing inkar in that which the leader brings. The muharramat, such as musical instruments that you find somewhere, you go and you break it. Mm. With muraat al masalih wal mafasid. Or you see alcohol somewhere and you break those alcohols. Ibn Rajab bin Rahimahullah mentions that understanding. He says, وَقَدْ يُجَابُ عَنْ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ التَّغِيرَ بِالْيَدِ لَا يَسْتَلْزِمُ الْقِتَالَ It doesn't mean fighting with the leader. وَقَدْ نَسَّ عَلَى ذَلِكَ أَحْمَدْ فِي رِوَايَةِ صَارِحٍ فَقَالَ التَّغِيرُ بِالْيَدِ لَيْسَ بِالسَّيْفِ وَالسِّلَاح وحينئذ فجهاد الأمراء باليد أن يزيل بيده ما فعلوه من المنكرات Whatever the leaders have made and done You go and you remove it with what? With your hand You go out and you destroy it مثل أن يريق خمورهم أو يكسر الآلات الملاهي التي لهم So he, you destroy the, the, thing, the you know, instrumental things that they put out there And also the alcohol that they put down there ونحو ذلك أو يبطل بيده ما أمروا به من الظلم إن كان له قدرة على ذلك or what he does is that he get, he destroys with his hands that which they commanded in terms of the oppression. So you're able to do that. In كان له قدرة على ذلك. For example, the family that you know that tomorrow are going to be harmed. You get at it there and you take them out of the place and you save them. You take them to safe haven. Okay. كل هذا جائز. And he said, وليس هو من باب قتالهم. This doesn't mean that you fight with them. ولا من الخروج عليهم. And Ibn Rajab said this hadith doesn't mean to do خروج on them. الذي ورد النهي عنه which the prohibition came فإن, فإن هذا أكثر ما يخشى منه أن يقتل الأمر وحده the why because if you go and you destroy the things that they put out of there who are they going to kill only you خلاص but if you do خروج they're going to fight back with not just you but all the other people the second response to this that's one response okay. the second response is that this hadith is talking about the early nations and it's not actually referring to our sharia and this is the view by the way of Ibn Salah and Nawawi now we actually took the opinion that this is the early nations. He said, "Ala anna al-hadith al hadith masuq fi man sabaqa min al-umam, wa laysa fi lafzihi dhikr li hadhi al-umma." هذا آخر كلام الشيخ أبي عمر وهو ظاهر كما قال. So this is the statement of Nawawi. He says this is what it appears to be, yeah. and this is also a view attributed to Ibn Salah. The third response is that uh, Al Imam Ahmed, when he saw this hadith. That is in a position to the many ahadiths where the Prophet talked about being patient with the oppressed Muslim leader. Uh, to be patient upon the Muslim leader, Ahmed weakened his hadith. Just uh, based on that reason? or uh, Yeah, because he said there's a illa, of course, there's a hid, these are mutawatir. Mm. There's a reason why this hadith is saying it. And not only did he just do that as well, Al Atharam did the same. And it's one of the reasons why scholars weaken hadith. Ahmed said, Ja'far hadha huwa Abu Abdullah al Humayd ibn Ja'far. والحارث ابن فضيل ليس بمحمود الحديث الحارث ابن فضيل who's in the chain ليس بمحمود الحديث it's not praiseworthy وهذا الكلام لا يشبه كلام ابن مسعود ابن مسعود يقول قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى تلقوني because he said this hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud right yeah we have another hadith of ibn Mas'ud which the prophet said be patient until you meet me on the fountain 
Mm. And that hadith he's saying is more stronger and better. Okay, it's more stronger and better. Al Athram, who's a student of Ibn Muhammad, he said, وَهَذَا عَنِ بْنِ مَسْعُودِ وَذَاكَ عَنِ بْنِ مَسْعُودِ This was narrated by Ibn Mas'ud and this was narrated by Ibn Mas'ud. وَهَذَا أَثْبَتُ الْإِسْنَادَيْنِ This one is more stronger in his chain. وَهُوَ مُوَافِقُ لِلْأَحَادِيثِ And it's also in line with all the other hadiths. Yeah. وَذَاكَ مُخَالِفٌ And this was in a position. ثُمَّ تَوَاتَرَتِ الْأَحَادِيثُ عَمْ لِلنَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم فَكَثُرَتْ عَنْهُ عَنِ الصَّحَابَةِ وَلَأَيْمَةِ بَعْدَهُمْ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْكَفِّ وَيَكْرَهُونَ الْخُرُوجَ وَيَنْسِبُونَ مَنْ خَالَفُمْ فِي ذَلِكَ إِلَى فِرَاقِ الْجَمَاعَةِ وَمَذْهَبُ الْحَرُورِيَةِ وَتَرْكِ السُنَّةِ now, This is the view of the Haruriya يعني Haruriya are the Khawarij yeah. So we can, get, we can get by the way it's just one of the responses Another view is that it's what? The early nations Another view is that it's not actually even talking about Khuruj ibn Rajab's قول I mentioned which is that it means whatever يعني, that they've put out there with looking at the masalih and the mafasid you can go and destroy it and do jihad with your hand Okay the next one I have for you is that they say it is permissible to rebel against the ruler with a sword due to the khuruj of Musa ibn Uqba. So this narration that you're mentioning that uh, Musa ibn Uqba narrated, um, they say that he said that Umar anhu said, لَنْ يَعْجَزَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُوَلُّوا رَجُلًا مِنْهُمْ فَإِنْ إِسْتَقَامَ إِتَّبِعُوهُ وَإِنْ جَنَفَ قَتَلُوهُ فَقَالَ طَلْحَةُ هِي سَتُهِمْ وَمَا عَلَيْكَ لَوْ قُلْتَ إِنْ إِنْ تَعَوَّجَ عزلوه فقال عمر لا القتل أنكل لمن بعده so عمر رضي الله عنه in this hadith is saying that he's saying kill the person okay uh, if he basically is uh, يعني oppressive if he's يعني uh, he goes away from the right path so Talha actually said to him why don't you just say remove him hmm. يعني, that's enough عمر no said no kill him because that is it's a, it's a strong message to those who come after. It's going to be a reminder for them. This is what's going to happen to you. So this we say, uh, it's Mursal. Yani Muslim ibn Uqba never heard from Umar. Is it Muslim and, or Musa? Sorry, Musa ibn Uqba. He never heard from Umar. And he didn't even reach the time of Umar al-Khattab. So there's a disconnection there. Okay. Uh, and also the hadith, Oh, this statement is actually مخالف it's in opposition to that which has authentically been transmitted from Umar, Umar anhu when he came to the advice that he gave to uh, Suwayd ibn Ghafala when he said to him Ya Aba Umayya inni la adri la'alli la alqaka ba'd abi hadha fasma' wa ati' wa in ummir alayka abdun habashiyun mujadda'un in daraba fa in daraba ka fasbir wa in harama ka fasbir wa in arada amran yantaqisu deena ka faqul سمع وطاعة ودم دون ديني فلا تفارق الجماعة ابن أبي شيبة narrated this عبد الرزاق بن همام الصنعاني narrated in his مصنف الأجري narrated in شريعة قلال also narrated in his كتاب السنة using as a proof and the oath chain is authentic from Umar and we mentioned this before that Umar said if, you, if, he, if he beats you be patient if he prevents you from what's your right be patient if he even tries to do something related to your religion then also listen and obey him in other things. As for this issue, say to him, Dini duna demi, my blood comes first before my religion. You're going to have to kill me if you want, but I'm not going to give him for my religion. But then he said, فَلَا تُفَارِقِ الْجَمَاعَةِ Don't also go against the jama'ah. The third response is that this is مُخَالِفُ لِلْأَدِلَّةِ الْمُتَوَاتِرَةِ It goes against the multitude narrations that we mentioned regarding going against the oppressive Muslim leader. And the fourth one is, is also in a position to what? لِإِجْمَاعِ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ وَمُعْتَقَدِهِمْ mm-hmm. It's in opposition to what? The Ijma' of Ahlul Sunnah and the Aqeed of Ahlul Sunnah that we mentioned all through the podcast. Barak Rafiq. The next one I have for you is uh, again an Athar from Umar radiallahu anhu uh, where it's narrated that he said do not be witnesses on earth until you take your rights from your leaders the way they take it from you and that you smack their necks in truth the way they, they are smacking your necks. So this Ibn Shabba Hafiz Umar ibn Shabba al-Basri who died in the year 262 uh, his name is Abu Zaid uh, he narrated this uh, he has a يعني, a kitab in tarikh which he mentions it in there and he mentions that al-Ash'ath and with him were jama'ah from the people of Kufa they went to Umar requesting him from removing Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas who was the emir of Kufa and was also one of the, you know, the courageous uh, people of Qadisiyah and he was also the Khalu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet's maternal uncle. 
uh, Umar removed him uh, because of their want and what they wanted, even though he believed in Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. And then he said something to them, which is what they tried to mention from the narration, is that part that you mentioned, which was, it was an accurate translation in English. The translation I've got is, do not be witnesses on earth until you take your rights from your leaders the way they take it from you, and that you smack their necks in truth the way they are smacking your necks. Uh, this, so they say this is basically the permissibility of doing al-khuruj with the sword upon a hakim who is jail al So we say the first of all, quickly and easily, the hadith is daif, the qissa is daif. In the chain is a man by the name of Harun ibn Abdullah al-Hadrami. No one يعني, graded him thiqah other than Ibn Hibban in his kitab al thiqat And you know the tawthiq of Ibn Hibban is mutasahil. Yani Ibn Hibban makes tawthiq of the majahil, people who are unknown. And uh, I haven't come across anyone who made tawthiq of him other than Ibn Hibban. So he is a majhulun and his jahala is jahala to hal. Okay? Also in the chain is a man by the name of Afif ibn Ma'di Karibin. Abu Hatim and Ibn Abdul Barr and Al Ajli, all of them they mention uh, that he's not a companion. Okay? And those who say that he is a companion, Afif ibn Ma'di Karibin, they actually didn't bring a proof for it. So if a person's him being a companion is actually not established, then he becomes what? Machul, unknown. Jahala to Halid. And also the fact that Al Ajli gave tawthiq to him, we don't also rely on it. This because there's a reason. Because uh, Al Ajli in his tawthiq when he prays and he does tawthiq of a, a majahil from the tabi'in he's more mutasahil than Ibn Hibban mm. and Al Mu'allim pointed this out in his kitab Al Tanqil bima fi ta'nib al kawthari min al abatil he said Fabnu Hibban qad yadhkur fi thiqat man yajid al Bukhari samahu fi tarikhihi min al qudama wa in lam ya'rif ma rawa wa amma al rawa wa man rawa anhu walakin Ibn Hibban يشدد وربما تعنت في من وجد في روايته ما 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 استنكره وان كان الرجل معروفا مكثرا والعجلي this part that concerns me he says والعجلي قريب منه في التوثيق المجاهيل من القدماء وكذلك ابن سعد and in his kitab al anwar al kashifa he says وتوثيق العجلي وجدته بالاستقراء كتوثيق ابن حبان او اوسع so he's like the توثيق of ibn hibban or probably even even bigger mm. So that weakens uh, that. Also, again, it goes against the athar that we mentioned from his advice to yeah. Swayd ibn Ghafala when he said to Ya Aba Umayya, Inni la adiri la'ali alqaka ba'da aami hadha, fasma' wa ati' wa in umir alayka abdun habashiyun mujadda'un wa in daraba bahraka fasbir wa in haramaka fasbir wa in arada amran yantakistu deenaka faqul sam'un wa ta'a wa damiduna deeni fala tufariq al jama'a. Also, it goes against the evidences which were mutawatir yeah. that command us to be patient upon the oppressive Muslim leader. And the fourth response is that it is also مخالفٌ لإجماع أهل السنة ومعتقدهم. It goes against the إجماع of أهل السنة والجماعة and the belief that has been mentioned in the books of Aqidah. Okay, the next one I have for you is that Ahmed ibn Nasr al Khuzai from the Imams. Uh, he was from the Imams who rebelled against Al Wathiq because he was an innovator. And Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahmed praised him by saying he sacrificed his soul for Allah's path. So this you're saying it shows that it's permissible to do a khuruj on an oppressive Muslim leader or an innovator. Uh, so this first of all we say that uh, there's a few ways of responding to it. The first one is that it hasn't been transmitted that the death or the reason why he was killed, this great Imam, Ahmed ibn Nasr al-Khuzai, it was because of khuruj. And Ibn uh, Khatib al Baghdadi mentions in his tarikh from the tariqa of Muhammad ibn Yahya al Suli. Okay, and he mentions the story. And in, the in that chain, Khatib al Baghdadi was one. In the chain is Muhammad ibn Yahya al Suli. And he never met Ahmad ibn Nasr al Khuzai. Because Ahmad ibn Nasr al Khuzai, he died in the year 231 Hijriya. And al Suli passed away, what? 336 Hijriya. So between their death is more than what? 800 years. Yeah. And there's no mentioning in the tarjama of Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Suli that he lived for a very long time. Rather, what is mentioned in his biography is that he narrated from Abu Dawood. This is considered from the student of um, uh, al-Imam Ahmad Nasr al khuzai Okay? Because Abu Dawood is considered to be like a student of al-Imam al-Bukhari, right? And Bukhari is considered to be a student of who? The tabak of al-Imam Ahmad, right? The third, second way of responding to this is that uh, this goes against the ijma'u ahli sunnah. 
Because Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they made ijma' that you're not allowed to go against the oppressive Muslim leader. And they also mentioned tabdi' of the one who does go against the oppressive Muslim leader. And from the people who transmitted a ijma' that the person is a mubtadi' who goes against an oppressive Muslim leader is none other than who? Al Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So it's very far fetched Ahmad will praise someone for something he transmits an ijma' for. Not only does he just transmit an ijma', but he also transmits yani, that that person is a mubtadi' for going against the oppressive Muslim leader. Also, that which uh, s- s- seems like mm. that uh, Ahmad ibn Nasr al-Khuzai was actually killed for was his patience on, uh, on the issue of the Qur'an being the speech of Allah wa ta'ala and that he wasn't created. And that is why the, the scholars praised him for. And Imam al-Dhahabi, he mentions, he says, قَالَ بِلُ الْجُلَيْدِ Ibn al-Juleyd said, سَمِعْتُ يَحْيَى بْنَ مَعِينٍ I heard Yahya ibn Ma'inin يَتَرَحَّمُ عَلَيْهِ Saying, Allah, Oh Allah, have rahma on Ahmad ibn Nasr al-Khuzai. Khatam Allah lahu bi shahada. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala ended his life based, based on shahada. He died upon shahada. Wa qala al-marudiyu, marudiyu, he said, Sabi'atu Ahmad ibn Hanbalin saying, about Ahmad Nasr al-Khuzai, he was saying, laqad jada bi nafsihi, he sacrificed his life. Yani he sacrificed his life here. What it seems like is that because of the issue of khalq al-Quran, the people being tested, he wasn't the only person who was killed. Abu, yani, great other imams, Abu Yaqub al Bwaiti was killed, Ibn Nuh was killed, yani, other people were murdered and killed by the leader because of this issue of the Khalq al Quran. And everyone knows the issue of Khalq al Quran was being tested on the people. It wasn't that the, the ulama were hiding, mm. they were willing to be silent, mm, yeah. but they were being tested. They were like, no, 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 come forward. What do you believe regarding this? Okay. Also, what we also have to remember is that Ahmad al Nasr al if he did do khuruj, mm. he's not a proof in and within himself. Remember we said that the ijma' precedes him, the ijma' before him. After the fitna of Ibn Ash'ad, ijma' came and that the statement of a great imam like this and other than him cannot be used as a proof. You can't say, Ahmad Nasr al said, so because of it is a, uh, it's a, it, uh, a proof. Okay? Uh, and Allah knows best subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Uh, do you believe that the uh, Muhammad ibn Sa'ud and Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rebelled against the Ottoman Empire? Uh, can I just go back to one thing that I just remembered about Ahmad ibn Nasr al-Khuzai? Okay. Uh, Abil Abbas ibn Sa'adin, as Imam al-Khattib al-Baghdadi mentions uh, in his tarikh, he mentions that the fifth volume, page 177, that Abil Abbas ibn Sa'adin, he said, لم يصبر في المحنة إلا أربعة كل من أهل مروا Four people were patient upon the محنة, يعني ديش وفقال القرآن. Ahmad ibn Hanbalin, Abu Abdillahi, Ahmad ibn Nasr ibn Malik al-Khuzai, Muhammad ibn Nuhin, Ibn Maymun al-Madrub wa Nu'aym ibn Muhammad al-Khuzai wa qad mata fi sijni muqayyidan fa amma Ahmad ibn Nasrina fa dhuribat unukuhu his neck was struck in wa hadhi nusqatun yani yani this shows that the issue of uh, the death of Ahmad ibn Nasr al-Khuzai was mainly because of the fact that he was what patient upon the issue of khalq al-Quran that's what he mentions. He doesn't mention that it was a kharij ala sultan. He wasn't, he doesn't mention that in the narrations. Hmm. Wallahu alam. Hey, sorry. Uh, Muhammad, ibn, uh, Muhammad ibn Saud and Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, did they rebel against the Ottoman Empire? So again, this is, again, the, these people are not the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. They are not a proof in and within themselves. So that's important that we understand. We believe, ashadu la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. The Prophet is the one في طاعته في ما أمر واجتناب ما نهى عنه وزجر وأن لا يعبد الله إلا بما شرع. Complete and utter obedience is for the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. If Ibn Abdul Wahhab, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al Qayyim, anyone goes against an oppressive Muslim leader, doesn't make it a proof. It's not a proof that you brought to the table. The proof is in the Quran and the mm-hmm. Sunnah and the Ijma. Yeah. And that stands here. Okay. But let's respond to this issue. Um, I already mentioned before, if you recall properly, that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. He's from the scholars who transmitted an ijma' of not going against an oppressive Muslim leader. And that's something that's present in his aqeedah. If you go to a risala known as Risalatu uh, Li Ahli Al Qasim, it's called. He said, Abdul Wahab mentions in there, Muhammad Abdul Wahab, Ibn Abdul Wahab, he mentions his aqeedah. He says, Wa ara I see wujub al sab'i wa ta'ati li a'imati al muslimina barrihim wa fajirim. I see that it's obligatory to obey the leader, the Muslim leaders, whether they are 
righteous or whether they are transgressors. Mm. As long as they don't command the people to do what? Sins. Sins. And anyone who takes khilafa, and the people come together for him, and they are pleased with him. وغلبهم بسيفه and he takes it over them with his sword حتى صار خليفة and he becomes the leader وجب طاعته his leader his يعني uh, uh, the obedience is obligatory for him وحرم الخروج عليه and it's haram to do خروج عليه he also said رحمه الله تعالى in his اصول السنة he said الأصل الثالث أن من تمام الاجتماع السمع والطاعة لمن تأمر علينا ولو كان عبدا حبشيا فبين الله هذا بيانا شافيا كافيا بوجوه من أنواع البيان شرعا وقدرا ثم صار هذا الأصل لا يعرف عند أكثر من من يدعي العلم فكيف العمل به so he says this in his أصول الستة and is also mentioned in his الدور الرسانية في الأجوبة النجدية the first volume page 173 where he affirms this creed so that's the first response inshallah the second response is that um you can't say someone done a khuruj if he's not under that leader. Mm. Which we spoke about before. Okay. About Ibn Zubayr. Um, and this is the reality that Dawla Uthmaniyyah, uh, Muhammad Abdul Wahab and Muhammad Ibn Su'ud, both of them were not under it. We want to know, prove it. Uh, Aziz Ibn Bazin, he said, لم يخرج شيخ محمد بن عبد الوهاب على الدولة الخلافة العثمانية فيما أعلم وأعتقد ابن عبد ابن باز إنه يسأل عبد العزيز بن باز هي سأل ابن عبد الوهاب did not go against the Ottoman Empire فيما أعلم according to my knowledge and I believe فلم يكن في نجد رئاسة ولا إمارة لأتراك they didn't have a leadership and they didn't have يعني anything in نجد بل كانت نجد إمارات صغيرة وقرى متناثرة Nejd was run by tribal leaders. Mm. Everybody had their little place. وعلى كل بلدة أو قرية مهما صورت أمير مستقل. Every poor part, they had their own leader, however small they were. It didn't matter. وهي إمارات بينها قتال وحروب ومشاجرات. And between them there were fights and يعني quarrels. And والشيخ محمد بن عبد الوهاب لم يخرج على دولة الخلافة وإنما خرج على أوضاع فاسدة في بلده. ابن عبد الوهاب he did خروج on people's what? people's wrongdoings and crimes. He got out on them and that. Mm. He fought in the sake of Allah for that. And he was patient because of it. Until Tawheed spread in that land. And he also spread elsewhere. And this is, inshallah ta'ala, something I want to go and discuss more and I want to speak about if Allah allows me in the future. Which is the difference between Muhammad Abdul Wahab and Ibn Taymiyyah is not different. Mm. They're both the same. The only difference is that Ibn Abdul Wahab was able to execute the things. A lot of the people who have things against Muhammad Abdul Wahab, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to spend quality time talking about it and I'm going to do a lot of series about it. Or even maybe a hot, hot, hot seat podcast once if we, if Allah gives us the chance, which is the problem with Ibn Abdul Wahab, we have to divide it into two. Is it ta'seel? Do you have theoretical problems with him? Are you indifference with him in terms of aqidah? Okay, that makes sense. And those people are either and or liberals or things like that. The second group of people who have things against Muhammad Abdul Wahab are people who have a problem with him in terms of application. Mm. They don't have issues with him in Aqidah. They believe in Tawheed, they believe in Shirk, they believe in يعني, all of the يعني, things that he mentions in Kitab Tawheed, but they differ with him in his application. Those people, inshallah ta'ala, we can talk to them about the historical events and how it took place. Okay, and the eyewitnesses that were there. Okay, we're not going to be using people who weren't there. Who, who are secondary resources, uh, sources. We're not going to be talking about people who are, yeah, and were informed about what was taking place. We'll, we'll go to the yeah, I mean, primary sources. And I won't go into that now because that wasn't the question we're doing. speaking about Khuruj. Yeah. But in essence, the first group, they would disagree with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab based on his Aqidah as well as Ibn Taymiyyah. And the second group say, we like Ibn Taymiyyah, we agree with him. But Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, we disagree with him because of the application. It's just that uh, he had they, the ability yeah, to yeah, execute Ibn was a, his yeah. beliefs and Ibn Taymiyyah didn't. But there was yeah. really no difference between the two. Uh, you know, that's the truth. That's the work there. Okay. Uh, also what proves that Najd al-Yamama in general and Dawla al-Su'ud, uh, which was in Dir'iyya specifically, was not under the Ottoman Empire is what Dr. Salih al-Ubud mentions as well. He said, لم تشهد نجد على العموم نفوذا لدولة العثمانية فيما امتد إليها سلطانها ولا أتى إليها ولاة عثمانيون 
ولا جابت خلال ديارها حامية تركية في الزمان الذي سبق ظهور دعوة شيخ محمد عبد الوهاب ومما يدل على هذه الحقيقة التاريخية استقراء تقسيمات الدولة العثمانية الإدارية فمن خلال رسالة تركية عنوانها قوانين آل عثمان مضامين دفتر الديوان يعني قوانين آل عثمان في مضا فيما يتضمنه دفتر الديوان ألفها يبان علي أفندي الذي كان أمينا لدفتر الخاقاني سنة أنا من شدية 1018 هجرية and uh, which was in line with the Gregorian calendar which it was uh, 1609 okay ومن خلال هذه الرسالة this letter which is an official letter on their side يتبين it mentions أنه منذ أوائل القرن الحادي عشر الهجري كانت دولة عث... آل عثمان تنقسم إلى ثنتين وثلاثين إيالة منها أربعة عشر إيالة عربية وبلاد نجل ليست منها ما عدا الإحساء إن اعتبرنا إن اعتبرناه من نجد When you look at uh, their own documentations that they state and they mention mm-hmm. the places that the Ottoman Empire was controlling, they don't mention in their Najd. They mention in their Al-Ihsa, if we consider Ihsa to be from Najd, which is, which is not the case. Okay? So the Ottoman Empire didn't want that desert. Why would he want to go to that desert mm-hmm. and be there? There was nothing there. There wasn't oil. There was nothing to, to, be, to be there for. Um... So we have Muhammad Abdul Hab's works, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, that which he mentions in his kitab, also Masail Jahiriya, Alati Khala Fi Rasulullah Fiha Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ahlul Jahiriya. He doesn't mention all of that. So um, and historically there's no Ottoman Empire which he did Khuruj on. Okay. The next thing I want to go into is something that we actually discussed previously, but since we actually brought it forward, but I've got it in my notes here. Let's mention it again, see if there's anything else you want to add. But it's important that the viewers go to the full discussion that we had previously. Obviously, now it's going to be much more summarized. And that is, can there be an ijma' that forms after an initial khilaf, especially if that khilaf took place at the time of the salaf? So, yeah, this issue we spoke about is the shubha that they tried to bring. Um, scholars have actually mentioned and stated, rahimahumullah, an ijma' for the issue of uh, khuruj, of the, uh, doing khuruj upon the oppressive Muslim leader that is not allowed. And as I mentioned to you that this ijma is between two what? Sorry, this khilaf that they've that, that we see is between two ijma's: the ijma of the Sahaba and the ijma of the the tab uh, the tabi. And Ali Fitnah bin Ashath after it, there was an ijma that happened, and also uh, the ijma of the Sahabas. Hab, let's just say for the sake of argument that there wasn't uh, any ijma at the time of the Sahabas, and there was only khilaf, and then there came an ijma. Okay. According to the strongest opinion, or even the view that the early Imams of Islam had from the Salaf, was that an ijma can take place, and it is considered an ijma even if there is a khilaf before it. Okay. The second response I want to give is that um, if we do say that, okay, you know what, you take that opinion that there can't be an ijma after a khilaf. We will say to you this particular surah, this particular mas'ala, the ones you're using, who you and you use argument you might use, they believe they're from the people who transmits this ijma'. For example, Shaykh ibn Uthaymi rahimahullah ta'ala. He believes that there is an ijma' in the mas'ala of dun khuruj al hakimi al fasiq. And he doesn't believe that this surah can be used as in that argument. Mm. Ta'ala. I already responded to the mistake of Abu Ya'la when he attributed this to a riwayah of Imam Muhammad. Yeah. And the first person who didn't agree with him, his own student, Abu al-Khattab. And he's, even if you go to the kitab, uh, Rawdha, Rawdha al-Nadir ibn Qudama, he doesn't take Abu Ya'la's uh, attribution of uh, this to Imam Muhammad. And these are great scholars of the madhab. Ibn Qudama is min a'immati al-madhab. He has a big sharah on the kitab, Mukhtasar al-Khiraqi, uh, which he called al-Mughni. So uh, this view of uh, being attributed to Ahmed it doesn't exist. So if Ahmed never said this, Wala Shafi'i never said this, Wala Malik didn't say this, يعني, Wala Abu Hanifa did not say this. The Salaf al-Salih, Ridwanullah al they did not say this. Does that make sense? Yeah. And late mutaakhirin usuliyin mentioned this. We'll say, La yu'awwalu alayhi. We won't look at this qa'idah that they brought, that they mentioned. Uh, now, And even if we do, we will say that this surah doesn't fall under it because this, has, this type is the ijma' which is qat'i. From and it's ijma from two perspectives. It's not just mm-hmm. one. Yeah. It's an ijma from the issue of not going against the oppressive Muslim leader, and an ijma on the issue of 
uh, if there's an evil that will come from uh, something greater than the current evil that's there, then you're not allowed to repel the evil with a greater evil. Yeah, and that's an ijma itself. There is a, there is a, these statements that we mentioned earlier, uh, Sheikh Rasam ibn Taymiyyah ibn Hajar as well, when he said about Al Hasan ibn Salih, istikar al amr, like the matter became settled. Does this, someone might ask, this suggest that they don't believe the ijma of the companions? They believe that there was a khilaf, and then the ijma came. No, they're just saying that there was an ijma. It doesn't. It's just that the khilaf that came, of course, it changed. The issue wasn't istikrar; it wasn't firm. Yeah. But then after the fitna of Ibn Ash'ath, istikrar al amru means the matter became solidified, and that was the only view that was taken. And this is something I want, inshallah ta'ala, people to understand. Why is it that all of the kutub al itiqad dismissed this other view and only stuck to one view? Hmm. The reason is because that view is invalid. That view was invalid. They yeah. saw it to be wrong. As important. Also, another thing is that the Prophet told us, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, "La min ala al-haqi la man wa la man khalif, hatta yati amru lahum ala that there's always going to be a people who are going to be holding. Are you there? Yeah. Uh, onto the uh, truth. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a ta'if for holding onto the truth. So why is it happened that from the time of Ibn Al Ash'ath onwards, after that, everybody who wrote Kitab in Aqidah documented the issue in Aqidah they dismissed his view and his view literally perished. It went. Yeah, yeah. Until Ibn Hazmin comes. Mm. Why did he die for that short, short period? Of time? Did you see my point? Yeah, yeah, I totally get it. All that time, all that time, this opinion was not there. The fact that it is permissible to khuruj. And if this opinion was not there and the Prophet said, there's always going to be a group upon the truth. It means it couldn't be the truth. Hey, nah, and Ibn Hazmin, he's, he's an individual, that the scholars, rahimahumullah, they, by jalalati wa imamati, with his knowledge and his understanding of the religion, and how powerful his knowledge was, la shak, he was. With that being said, like he had shawad, many strange things that he came with, many strange things that he came with. From them is his crit criticism on uh, Imam Tirmidhi. Mm. Yani, and considering that Tirmidhi is an unknown person, for example. And the scholars, they said that this is not a criticism to Tirmidhi, rather it's a criticism to you that you don't even know who Tirmidhi is. So you can imagine this is, yani, there's a lot of issues shawad mm. uh, that he came with. For example, he weakens the hadith of Hadith al iftiraq Imam Ibn Ibn Hazmin and he permits music and يعني, uh, we can a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and يعني, Iraqi had to even say uh, uh, يعني, that don't even give any consideration لا تسغير Ibn Hazmin al-Mukhari don't give consideration to what Ibn Hazmin says so يعني, he's no way the same caliber of uh, Ibn Taymiyyah or someone who's يعني, grounded himself in learning Madhab al-Salaf and and Qutb al-Hadith and etc. Or okay. even no, Ivan al Nawi and his Kalaba. Or even Abd Ibn Abd al-Barr and his Kalaba. Naam. Okay, the next one I have for you is that rebellion, khuruj, is not called khuruj unless it is with a sword. This again as well, it's so that from, from there they want to take the, the, the issue of mudaharat, for example. It's, you know, it's, it's just, what we say first of all, it's not mudaharat, it's muharram. We already mentioned it, right? And that's the bare minimum that can actually be said about mudaharat. Uh, and the person who does mudaharat to the leader on the grounds that he believes he's a kafir, that's a khariji, right? And the one who believes he's getting close to Allah, he's a mubtadi. Yeah, yeah. The one who, the one who goes against, uh, يعني, against, against it, believing that you're allowed to go against an inner, uh, يعني, oppressive Muslim leader, he's a mubtadi. He believes he should drop, he should yeah. go. He's an oppressive leader, but he's Muslim. He's a what? And anyone who's going against it for worldly reasons, now, he's a mufsidun fil ardi. So that's the levels of the people who do mudaharat, if we look into it in that, in that way. Okay. Also, somebody can actually be a khariji without having sheaths his sword. He can be still a khariji just by believing the belief of the khawarij. Okay. Even if you don't do khuruj. We all know about the khawarij al qadiyah uh, who just and he sit back and they yeah. believe it. Okay. And speech already we mentioned about the leader is haram. You're not allowed to. And we mentioned the statement of uh, Abdullah ibn Ukaymin when he said ala dami abada ba'da Uthmanin. from this day onwards today I'm not going to aid in the uh, blood of the uh, Khalifa after Uthman and they said to him anta ala dami. did you aid in the blood of Uthman Faqa uh, f then he responded f saying uh, inni, uh, uh, inni a'uddu dhikra masawihi awnan ala dami. I consider mentioning his faults aiding in his blood Ibn Sa'ad mentions this in his kitab, in his tabaqat. So this shows you that the f just speaking, 
he's considering it to be what? He's saying that just by speaking, without even me shedding, yeah, and he going out there and taking my sword, just by speaking, I believe that I am helping in his blood. So it's dangerous. On that point, then we're talking about speaking. I want to go to the incident of Dhul Khuwaisara. If you believe that speaking against the ruler, and obviously the ruler at that time was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, can speaking out against the ruler make someone a khariji? So this hadith that you mentioned, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, يعني, a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam whilst the Prophet was given the يعني, spoils of war, uh, and his name was Khudu Khuwaisira, and he was a man from you know the people of Bani Tamim. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, i'dil. The Prophet then said, Wailak. Who's going to be just if I'm not just? The Prophet said, Qad khibta wa khasirta illam akun a'dilu. And you're destroyed and you are in a state of loss if I am not just. Then mm -hmm. Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, i'dhali, O Messenger of Allah, allow me to snack, yani to slice yes. the neck of this man. Then the Prophet responded to him. He said to him, Da'hu, leave him. فَإِنَّ لَهُ أَصْحَابًا This man's got followers. يَحْقِرُ أَحَدُكُمْ صَلَاتَهُ مَعَ صَلَاتِهِمْ You, one of you guys will belittle your prayer when you look at his prayer. وَصِيَامَهُ مَعَ صِيَامِهِمْ And you belittle your fasting in comparison to his fasting. يَقْرَؤُونَ الْقُرْآنَ They read the Qur'an. لَا يُجَاوِزُ تَرَاقِيَهُمْ It doesn't pass their collarbone. يَمْرُقُونَ مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ They exit Islam. كَمَا يَمْرُقُ السَّهْمُ مِنَ الرَّمِيَ Ibn Taymiyyah used this hadith, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he used this to say that this is the first khariji, Dhu Khuwaisira. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, in his Majmu'u al-Fatawa, the 28th volume, he said, when Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna ma dhakara al-khawarij al-haruriyata li annahum awwalu sinfin min ahli al-bid'i, bid'i, kharaju ba'dahu. Bal, awwaluhum kharaja fi hayatihi. This is the part that I want. The first khariji went against who? The Prophet, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Now I want you to understand. The Prophet said, uh, Ibn al-Taymi is saying, بَلْ أَوَّلُهُمْ خَرَجَ فِي حَيَاتِهِ The first one came out at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam. Then the first khawarij came out. But did, what did, uh, did uh, uh, Dhul Khwaisira, uh, Tamimi, did he take a sword? No, but he also didn't make takfir based on sins. That's not that's not only what he makes you a khawarij. You remember the beginning of the khawarij were different from the, the ones after it became I'm going to mention to you the statement of Faqihu Zaman, Al Allama Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin. And if you want to critique Ibn Uthaymin, you want to say something about him, it's totally up to you. You're going to stand in front of Allah Yawm al Qiyamah, what you say about this great scholar. He said, وَهَذَا أَكْبَرُ دَلِيلٍ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ الْخُرُوجَ عَلَىٰ الْإِمَامِ يَكُونُ بِالسَّيْفِ. This is the strongest evidence to show that the khuruj on the Muslim leader can be by the sword. Okay? وَيَكُونُ it can also be by what? بِالْقَوْلِ وَالْكَلَامِ. By speech. And statement يعني هذا ما أخذ السيفة This one he didn't take the sword على الرسول to the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام So he didn't do that What did he do? لكنه أنكر But rather what he did was He أنكر عليه He rejected what the Prophet صلى الله He rejected what the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was doing صلى الله عليه وسلم This is important I want you to understand He is saying Ibn Uthaymi رحمه الله تعالى All this is what he did and Ibn Uthaymin went on to say, وَمَا يُوجَدُ فِي بَعْضِ كُتُبِ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ And that which is found in some of the books of Ahlul Sunnah, يعني أن الخوارج, the خوارج, they do خروج على الإمام, they do خروج the leader by the sword. What they mean by this is that, يعني الخروج النهائي. This is the final form of the خروج. Mm. But the beginning is what? The beginning is the speech. Yeah. And then later it becomes the final one is the sword. Ibn Uthaymi is talking I'm not, It's not me this by the way Ibn mm -hmm. said Az-zina yakunu bil ayn The zina can be with the eye Wa yakunu bil udhun It can be with the ear Wa yakunu bil yad It can be with the hand right Yakunu bil rijl It can be with the legs Lakin al-zina al-a'ram Is which one Al-ladhi huwa Al-ladhi huwa zina Al-haqiqiyu Huwa zina al-farj It's when the private one part does it mm -hmm. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He said Wal-farj yusaddiqu dhalika Aw yukadhibu then he says, رحمه الله تعالى رحمة واسعة. He said, فهذه العبارة من بعض العلماء هذا هو مرادهم. ونحن نعلم علم اليقين. We know by knowledge, certain knowledge, certainty, بمقتضى طبيعة الحال أنه لا يمكن الخروج بالسلطان إلا وقد سبقه خروج باللسان والقول. No one's gonna go and just sheath the sword and go out to the leader and fight with him with the sword unless they've done what 
mm. spoken out against, spoken him. against yes. him for a bit. Yeah. And then he goes into the issue of that the uh, statement is a means to what? The m- major khuruj. And he mentions this, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his explanation on the great book of Shawkani known as Raf al Asatin fi hukm li tisari bis salatin. Now, inshallah ta'ala, I want to mention Sheikh Salah al Fawzan, hafizahullah, who's still alive, fi qaid al hayat. When he was explaining his kitab, al Safariniya, he says, Al khuruj ala al aimat yakunu bis saifi. It can be by the sword And that's the greatest form That's the what? Greatest form Ibn Fawzan he says And it can also be by speech By insulting them The name calling them And speaking about them in, on the pulpits And on the uh, your gatherings mm. Until he said فَالْكَلَامُ خُرُوجٌ he said that Rahimahullah ta'ala So he's not the only one I already mentioned the statement of Abdullah ibn Uqaymin And what he said La u'inu ala dami Uthman I will never help, help anyone In the blood of who? Uthman yeah. And uh, The khawarij al-qa'adiyya Who didn't even do khuruj What were they doing? If you look at a statement That was mentioned By uh, Ibn al-Qayyim Ibn hajar sorry In his kitab had you study page 483 when he was counting the, the types of firaq al khawarij he said well qa'adiyya the qa'adiyya who are a type of khawarij which they don't they don't go out and do khuruj okay what do they do alladhina yuzayyinuna al khuruj they beautify khuruj by speech ala al a'immati wa la yubashiruna dhalik but they don't physically do it rather i'll give you a clear example al hasan ibn salih ibn hay has he ever done khuruj to anyone he actually didn't do it. It's actually transmitted by Khalan in Kitab al-Sunnah, page 94, from Yahya ibn Adam in that he said, هَا هُنَا قَوْمٌ يَنْتَحِلُونَ قَوْلَ الْحَسَنِ بْنُ صَالِحٍ قَدْ هَلَكُوا They are destroyed. وَسَمِعْتُ آيْهَادْ الْحَسَنِ بْنُ صَالِحٍ سَيِّنْ لَا أَخْرُجُ وَإِمَامٌ قَائِمٌ I'm never going to go against when there is an imam. وَلَا أَخْرُجُ إِلَّا فِي فُرْقَةٍ And I'm only going to do khuruj when there is disunity. وَلَا أَخْرُجُ إِلَّا فِي جُنْدٍ يُوَازِ عَدُوِّي And I'm only going to do khuruj Okay, with an army that is equal to my enemy. La ulki biyadi ila tahluka. I'm never going to throw myself into destruction. Wala akhruj, and I'm also not going to do khuruj. He said, Wala akhruj, I'm not going to do khuruj. Uh, who's saying this? Al Hasan ibn Salih. Yani Allah, yani he gave conditions one after the mm-hmm. That's when I'm going to do khuruj. In other words, Al Hasan ibn Salih, shurut of khuruj is actually stronger than a lot of these people. Ma'adalika da ahlul ilm, they considered him to be what? From the from the Mubtadi'ah I considered him to be from the Mubtadi'ah then, Because he believed in khuruj by statement He was saying it, he was beautifying it to the people So what I mean is that yes of course it can be So of course these noble scholars That live in our time And Sheikh Nathamin obviously a recent scholar as well Rahimahullah Okay fine, um, last question I have on that Is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Along the lines of If I was to be around the time If I was to meet his lineage I would kill them If he said that then why didn't he kill Dhul Khuwais then? So the Prophet ﷺ did mention that لَإِنْ لَقِيْتُمُوهُمْ if, لَإِنْ لَقِيْتُمُوهُمْ If I meet them لَأَقْتُلَنَّهُمْ قَتْلَ عَاد The Prophet said that عليه I'll kill them like the people of Ad mm. And we know in the Quran Allah how he spoke about the people of Ad He said وَهَلْ فَهَلْتَ رَلَهُمْ مِنْ بَاقِيَا Do you see any remaining of the people of Ad I, mean, I, will, I will annihilate them I will nuke them off the face of this earth That's what the Prophet is trying to say And the Khawarij are the type of people That you fight them You don't take contract with them uh, you don't take contracts with them And you don't take them as spoils of war You kill them It's an ideology you fight Okay The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Every time a, a group come out قطر, Until the last of them will be with Dajjal Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Now what I want you to understand here is That The Prophet said, said that Alaihi Wasallam It's established from him authentically Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yeah. Here on the other side he's saying Why did he choose not to kill him The reason why the Prophet chose not to kill him He said uh, because the people that the people will say that Muhammad is killing his what? His own followers. Yeah. Yani, uh, if, if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi turned around and he killed Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salala and he went and he killed what do you call it? Dhul uh, Khwaisira uh, and Tamimi and he killed all of these people. The Prophet was looking at the bigger picture. What are the people going to say? They're not going to be like, oh, he's, these people were, were uh, hypocrites. No, it's just that Muhammad felt like killing his own followers. It actually mentions the reason in the narration he gave it himself. 
Okay. Um, next thing I want to mention, which is actually a hadith. Also, another thing that scholars took from it is that the Khawarij, if they believe what they believe, they don't go out and do physically anything. Okay. They're not killed. Which is another hikmah that scholars mentioned. Because some of the scholars, they mentioned the narration that Muhammad does not, he's not going to kill his, uh, um, uh, his own followers. He was, some scholars, they mentioned that the narration is specific to Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salal. Mm. Abdullah ibn Ubay. Abdullah ibn Ubay. Now, he's not, uh, the Prophet is going to not kill him. Now, Muhammad kills his own followers. What we say is the reason why the Prophet or whatever the case may be, the reason why the Prophet didn't want to kill him is the same as the Munafiqeen. That's one. Number two is that uh, the Khawarij are not fought unless they are what? Unless they are acting upon their belief. They okay. just believe and they're just uh, nobody will touch them. They can still be Khawarij, but we. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's the strongest opinion. Ali ibn Abi Talib in the masjid while he was doing khutbah, while he's standing on the pulpit, they would say to him, La hukma illa lillah. La hukma illa in the masjid kufa. And then the Prophet Ali would be saying, Kalima tu haqqil urida biha batilun. And they will stand up after him and scream and shout. Are you there? Yeah. And he didn't fight them until they done what? Until they went to Harula, they cut off from the people, they made themselves followers, and they, then they went against him. That's when Ali ibn Abi Talib fought them. So Nabi Lai Muhammad is not going to fight somebody who's just keeping his, his view to himself. Mm. Now. Okay. The next one is also something that I brought up before. So naturally, things have been brought up before in the discussion, but I also have them in my notes here, and let's cover it, inshallah. Uh, the hadith, Man kutila duna malihi fa huwa shaheed. How do we understand this? Because is this not applied to fighting with the rulers as well? And I think we discussed this before, but if you have anything more to add, you can add it here, inshallah. Uh, sorry, the, the English translation, whoever dies while defending his property is a martyr. Okay. Uh, the, Ibn, Ibn al-Mundir, I mentioned a statement that he said, Rahimahullah ta'ala, that the scholars are unanimously in agreement yeah. that it's not permissible for you to do what? Uh, uh, and the scholars are unanimously in agreement, sorry, that this hadith, man qutila duna marihi, does not apply on the leader. It's an exception for the ruler here. Uh, naam. The rule is an exception in this issue. And there's two issues. One is the statement of Ibn al that Abdul Razak ibn Hamam Sanani mentions, ما علمت أحد كار يتحرج من قتل هؤلاء تأثما ولا من ولا من قتل من أراد مالك إلا السلطان فإن للسلطان حقا. And the statement of Ibn al-Mundir he transmits it to He said والذي عليه أهل العلم that which the people of knowledge are upon أن للرجل أن يدفع ما ذكر that he's allowed to defend himself in that which has been mentioned إذا أريد ظلما بغير تفصيل if someone wants to oppress you and wrong you you are given the rights to go you have the rights to go and defend yourself. إلا أن كل من يحفظ عنه من علماء الحديث، but the scholars of hadith that knowledge has been taken from كالمجمعين على استثناء السلطان. Hmm. They mentioned that the leader is an exception. للآثار الواردة بالأمر بالصبر على جوره وترك القيام عليه. And they use what evidences? The evidences that command us to be patient upon his transgression and leaving of standing against him. Ibn Mudir says that in his Al uh, Sharaf. And Ibn Hajar transmits it in his Fatuh al-Bari, the fifth volume, page 124. Ibn Battal also transmits it in his Sharh al-Sahih al-Bukhari, the sixth volume, page 608. And I'm mentioning two great scholars, Ibn Battal transmits and affirms it. Ibn Hajar transmits it and affirms it, that this ijma exists. So these are three great scholars that are, uh, that are there, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah, the other side uses hadith quite a lot, but maybe they weren't previously aware of the ijma, but now they are, inshallah. Yeah, okay, uh, next one again is an issue we've discussed before, is the hadith narrated by Ibn Habban on the authority of Ubaid ibn Samid. So you obviously have a hadith on your side that you say that we are not allowed to rebel against a Muslim ruler or against an oppressive ruler unless we see kufr and bawakhan, clear kufr. They say that there's another hadith, another narration with the wording, and again, this is something we covered before, uh, uh, which means that unless we see a clear sin from him and therefore oppression and fisk and everything now becomes something we can do khuruj on. So I really responded to this hadith, hadith Ibn Hibban. And it's funny because if they take this hadith, alhamdulillah, it actually makes the hadith in hadith uh, al-Imam Muslim in Sahih, in which they reject it mm. because of the, the disconnection that they mentioned, that Dara Qutni and Nawi mentioned, then that means this hadith would be used as a... Uh, Shahid for it. And Dar Qudni and Ibn Hajj al Haythami. Was it? Was it Nawi? No, I'm talking about Hadith Idara Bada Ahrak wa Akhada Barak. Hadith Sahih Muslim. Amu Akhida Barak. We would strengthen it with Hadith Ubadis bin Usamid here. Because they, they said it's authentic. 
The other party have admitted this hadith is sahih. Ibn Hibban narrated. This one, ma'asiyat uh, lillah. But before that, what does he say? Illa antu kula ma'asiyat lillah. Ubawahan. What's before it? Ubada. He said, "Qul tu la baika." The Prophet said, "Ya Ubada." Oh Ubada. The Ubad said, "La baika." The Prophet said, "Isma' wa ati' fi usrika wa yusrika wa man shatika wa makrahika wa atharatin alika wa in akalu malika wa darab dharak illa antu kula ma'asiyat lillah ubawahan." So if the other party accept this hadith, alhamdulillah, I like it because of two things. Number four, one is that in it it mentions that. The, your wealth is taken and your he, he beats he lashes your 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 back i would use the hadith as a to even if you weaken muslim no problem we'll just use this one this part from it <laughs> second thing is that this hadith has two meanings i already mentioned it the yeah. first one is leaving off obeying the imam the time when he's commanding you to do that which is a sin that's what the hadith shows because the other riwayah of imam muhammad is clear in that matter where it says مَا لَمْ يَأْمُرُوا بِإِثْمٍ بَوَاحًا As long as he doesn't command you what? Yeah. A clear-cut sin. Yeah, so bring all the riwayah together. That's, what, that's talking about something different. Yeah, and we already mentioned لَا طَعَةَ لِمَخْلُقِ فِي بَعْسِيَةِ الْخَالِقِ Of course you don't obey the leader in obedience or disobedience of Allah. Yeah. That is enough for me to respond. I can, that's it. خلاص, I can stop there. But I'm going to add a second meaning to it, inshallah ta'ala. Which is that this issue, we have to distinguish between the chapter of Al-Amr bil-Ma'ruf وَالنَّهِيَ عَنِ الْمُكَرِ which is one thing. And the issue of al-khuruj al al-hakim al-fasiq Going against the oppressive Muslim leader They're two different things And al-imam al-nawawi in the sharah of the hadith did that hmm. He distinguished between the issue of al-amr bil-ma'ruf And the issue of what? Al-khuruj He says as, as for al-amr bil-ma'ruf Ibn al-nawawi mentions Let me just read his kalam He okay. says Wal-muradu bil-kufri huna Al-ma'asiyah ومعنى عندكم من الله في برهان من زواد أي تعلمونه من دين الله تعالى ومعنى الحديث لا تنازع ولاة الأمور في ولايتهم ولا تعترض عليهم إلا أن تروا منهم منكرا محققا تعلمونه من قواعد الإسلام فإذا رأيتم ذلك so don't go against the leaders don't hug with them uh, in a ولاية and don't go against them unless you see what إلا أن تروا منكرا محققا unless you see a munkar which is known established that it's munkar how do you know it تعلمون من قواعد الإسلام you know it from the principles of Islam that this is a munkar فإذا رأيتم ذلك if you see this what do I do فأنكروا عليهم reject this from them وقولوا بالحق حيث ما كنتم and say the truth wherever you are hmm. say the truth when you're with the leader, you tell him in his face. You say, Taqila, what you're doing is wrong. If he's not with you, you speak about the matter without me mentioning his name. Yeah. We already spoke about that, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed. That's the Al-Amr ibn al Okay. Look what the Nawi says after that. وَأَمَّ الْخُرُوجُ As for khuruj, عَلَيْهِمْ Going and uprising and going against these oppressive leaders وَقِتَالُهُمْ فَحَرَامٌ بِإِجْمَاعِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ By unanimous agreement of the Muslims. وَإِن كَانُوا فَسَقَةً ظَالِمِينَ Even if they are what? Transgressive, oppressive leaders. So, now we say, okay, the hadith is saying to you, Hadith Ubaid ibn Samit, that part where it says, Illa an takuna lillahi bawaha. It means when you see that, you gave him bay'ah, listen to him in the times of ease, times of hardship, be a good marate, slave of Allah, obey your leader. But when you see sins from him, advise him, hmm. correct this mistake, rectify this situation. Call to the good and prohibit the evil. But as for khuruj, la la la. As for fighting them, la. By unanimous agreement, you're not allowed to do that. That's what we said to you. So, whichever of those two understandings that you take from the hadith, none of them support the person. Yeah. None I'm of them what? Support the person. It doesn't support the person. What was the narration by Ibn Khab? And finally, Ibn I just Khabbar. want to say a, third, a second point, which is that to say al ma'asiyah is a kufr is madhabru al khawarij, as it's well known. So I don't think does he believe that kufr is a ma'asiyah because the hadith remember illa an tara kufran bawahan indakum min Allah fi burhan are you saying bawaha kufran bawahan here it means ma'asiyah so in other words no I think they're saying it's very separate they're saying if you see kufr you can go against him if you see ma'asiyah you can go against him the two separate things they're not saying it's the same thing okay but the the hadith in Ibn Khiban what was it in uh, what was the hadith again have you what was the narration remind me Hadith uh, The one Habad. we're just talking about now You mentioned it before yes, Hadith Ubaid ibn Samit Yes yeah. Where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him He said Ya Ubaid oh Ubaid He said Labbaika I'm here to obey your messenger of Allah The Prophet Isma wa ati' Listen and obey. obey And after that Fi usrika at times of hardship Wa yusrika at times of ease Wa man shatika when you're enthusiastic Wa makrahika when you dislike it Wa atharatin alayka when you see favoritism Wa in akalu malaka even when you see his When he takes your wealth Wa darabu dhaharaka and he lashes your back Illa, this is the time you don't listen to him. 
illa an takuna ma'siyatan lillahi bawaha can it not be said that taking your wealth and beating your back is a sin yeah it is a sin so the prophet said listen to ah, even if you, you, ah, yeah of course so why would he say even if he and then uh, right after that say it's, unless it's a sin yeah, it doesn't right, make sense right, a contradiction right, yeah. and to bring bihaq in there like they tried to do again as no evidence we already yeah. spoke so okay um where am I where am I now there's uh, yeah we've discussed that okay the next one is uh, the rulers are opposed and stood against due to their sin as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there will be leaders you will recognize them and you will dislike them whoever opposes them will be successful and whoever stays away from them will be safe and anyone who mixes them will be destroyed so this hadith say yakunu umara ta'rifuna wa tunkiruna faman nabadhahum naja wa man a'tazalahum salima wa man khalatahum halak this hadith is dha'if you know it's dha'if and sheikh al albari weakened it riwayatan wa dirayatan he weakened it in terms of its chain and its authentication and the way it's been transmitted and it also weakened it in terms of what? Its meaning. So that's the first response. Also, it's a, this hadith is in opposition to the Adilla al mutawatira the multitude narrations that we mentioned to be patient upon the oppressive Muslim leader as we mentioned previously. Also, it's in opposition to the Ijma' wa Ahli Sunnati and the Aqeedah, what, what they mention in their Kutub al Atiqad. Also, even if we say the hadith is Sahih, the part that they want to use from the hadith is فَمَنْ نَابَذَهُمْ hmm. They want to say that uh, the person he does munabada. Yeah. Uh, we say munabada here means by speech, and it means ala which in shar'iyin. In a shar'i way, he goes and he corrects him. And Abdul Rauf al Manawi mentions that. Rahimahullah Taala in his kitab Fathul Qail Faidul Qadir, he mentions it. The thirty ninth page. He says, "Sayyakun umara ta'rifuna, yani tarbona baad aqwalihim wa afgalihim li kuni fi al jumla fi al jumla ti mashru'ah." مشروعا وتنكرون هي سيز بعضها لقبحه شرعا فمن نابذهم the one who does منابذة of it يعني dismisses it and tosses it and ignore يعني يعني أي أنكره بلساني rejects it with his tongue بما بما لا يوافق الشرع when it's not in line with the شريعة نجا that person will be saved from what من المنافق من النفاق والمداهنة so here فمن نابذهم here doesn't mean with the sword it doesn't mean he rejects it with the sword It means he rejects it with the tongue That's if we accept its authenticity Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay um, The next one is uh, uh, The people of Medina sought an Islamic ruling from Imam Malik ibn Anas Regarding the rebellion Regarding rebellion with an nafs al zakiyah And Malik ruled that it is permissible So the first response to this inshallah ta'ala Is three responses The first one is that this fatwa Ibn Jarir al-Tabari mentions it in his tarikh okay. Ibn Jarir mentions it in his tarikh the seventh volume, page 516. And what we say is that in the chain, there's a man by the name of Sa'ad ibn Abdul Hamid. Okay? okay. Sa'ad ibn Abdul Hamid, na, even though he's acceptable in hadith, there's also weakness in him. Okay? Especially if he may narrate something that he's singular in and alone in. وَلِذَلِكَ إِبْنُ حِبَّان said about him, كَانَ مِمَّنْ يَرَى he would mention narrations which are munkar from well-known scholars. Hafiz, he said in his kitab al-Takhrib that he is صدوق. He's a truthful person. Like له أغاليط. أما له أغاليط. He has many mistakes. يعني غلط من أغاليط. Also, this man Saad ibn Abdul Hamid narrates from who? He narrates from someone who's unknown. This is another point. Jahalatu man rawa anhum. The person is narrating from, he said, Akhbarani ghayr wahidin. Ghayr wahidin, who is? It's mature. We don't know who, who he's talking about here. So in terms of the chain, is not authentic. Also, if Imam Malik did, was in a position in the issue of sihatu bay'at, bay'at al-mutaghallib, if he was against the idea of a leader who came by force, he did believe that that bay'at is batil, it doesn't exist. If Malik was to believe that, A'immatu sunnah would have clarified that for us, right? And they would have mentioned it from his strange views that he holds. Especially when they are mentioning as Mas'ala Ijma'iyya. They would have clarified it for us. And the scholars that actually transmitted a Ijma' that we still have to listen and obey a, a leader who took by Ghalaba is none other than Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qairawani who is called, his name was by the way, Malik al-Saghir they used to call him. <laughs> and Ibn Battal al-Maliki, these are Imam of the Madhab of Imam Malik. And we already mentioned it, that Kitab al-Risala, that Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qirawani, the part of Aqid at the beginning, he mentions that this is the view of who? And Imam Malik. This is this view of Imam Malik, and I mentioned that before. Okay. Also, another response is that the reason why Malik was beaten 
رحمه الله تعالى there are many views regarding it الإمام مالك what was the cause of his hitting يعني they, they trying to say that he gave fatwa الإمام مالك to do خروج upon uh, uh, the nafs zakia uh, he gave that fatwa and uh, because the bay'ah of it for Abi Ja'far al-Mansur it was ikrah and they mentioned that uh, and because of that Malik was beaten for it and he was punished because of it the reason why Malik was beaten by the way is not a mas'ala uh, ulama have agreed upon yani the reason why Malik was hidden when he mentions the reason he says it was mentioned from him he says that Malik Look at what he mentioned at the beginning, Qadi Iyad. He says, وَذُكِرَ عَنْهُ It was mentioned from me. سِغَةُ التَّمْرِيضِ Qadi Iyad is not even 100% for it. Mm. So the reason why Malik was beaten is a matter which is not clear. There's many views. رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ رَحْمَةً وَسِعَةً Okay, you'll be pleased to know this is the final question, the final statement of a scholar that I've got for you before we move on to something else which are the hypothetical scenarios and going on to some of the statements that you've said before. So this is a scholar that I know you respect very much, Abdurrahman al-Mu'allimi. <laughs> it said in his book at Tenkil, Abu Hanifa used to obligate or recommend rebelling against the rulers of Bani Abbas after oppression became apparent from them and he saw fighting them to be better than fighting the kuffar. How do you reconcile this with this with your view? Al Mu'allimi rahimahullah ta'ala he mentioned this statement of his يعني, I read it many years back from his kitab at Tanqil bima fi ta'rib al kawthari min al abatil the first volume page 288. He says kana Abu Hanifa yastahibbu aw yujib al khuruj ala khulafa Ibn al Abbas lima dhahra minhum min al dhulmi wa yara qitalahum khayran min qitalik al kuffari. وأبو إسحاق ينكر ذلك وكان أهل العلم مختلفين في ذلك فمن كان يرى الخروج يراه من الأمر بالمعروف والنهي عن المنكر والقيام بالحق ومن كان يكرهه يرى أنه شق لعصى المسلمين وتفريق لكلمتهم وتشتيت لجماعتهم وتمزيق لوحدتهم وشغل لهم بقتل بعضهم بعضا فتهن قوتهم وتقوى شوكة عدوهم وتتعطل ثغورهم فيستولي عليها عدوهم أنتم هي سيز هذا والنصوص الذي التي يحتج بها البارعون من الخروج والمجيزون له معروفة والمحققون this is the part, yeah. part that really to be honest for me is more of a شبهة than anything else yeah. he says والمحققون يجمعون بين ذلك بأنه إذا غلب على الظن أن من ينشأ عن الخروج من المفاسد أخف جدا مما يغلب على الظن أنه ينفع به جاز الخروج وإلا فلا وهذا النظر قد يختلف فيه المجتهد yeah, and he brings it back to a mas'ala that we mentioned before, that the issue of khuruj, it goes back to the masalih and the mafasid. Abdul Rahman al Ali is one of the most highly respected people to me after Shaykh al Ibn Taymiyyah from the Mutakhirin. I truly love him. But the response, inshallah ta'ala, to his issue is number one. The mas'ala to al khuruj ala al-hakim al-fasiq, al-zalim, uh, he mentions that there's two views in it. And that is wrong. This mas'ala, ijma' ahlu sunnah wal jama'ah is there. Second response that I want to mention Because I mentioned 33 imams yeah. We'll say the sheikh did a mistake by saying this Number two He doesn't break the ijma'ah By mentioning a khilaf in the mas'ala I'm going to come to it Let me finish my points okay. The second is that Attributing the permissibility of khuruj To the muhaqqiqin of the people of knowledge And saying that the matter goes back to Looking at the masalih and the mafasid That's wrong That is actually wrong And I responded to this issue When I spoke about the issue of masalih and yes. Mafasid, I spoke about it. Also, um, why did he not mention who are the Muhaqqiqin that he's referring to? So we can look at their situation. Does he mean by the Muhaqqiqin Ibn Hazmin? Mm. Is he referring to him? Because if it is, we responded to that. So we know who he's referring to. Uh, that's important for us to know. Or is he referring to the, some of the Imams of the Ahlul Sunnah? That's, or another response is, uh, it is not permissible for us to use the 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 the, 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 yani the statement of Mu'allimi when he said the issue of the evidences of al-amru bil-ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar to go against oppressing Muslim leader because those are general evidences and to be patient upon the oppression of the leader to be patient upon the oppression uh, oppression of the leader is what specific evidences and there are ijma on that mas'ala also 
Mu'allim is attributing it to who in here? Abu Hanifa. And we already responded. Abu Hanifa repented from that and came back from that yeah. view. Yeah. We already mentioned that. Uh, rahimahullah. Okay. So I think when he mentions, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Ibn Hazm is who he's referring to from the muhaqqiqin. And Ibn Hazm as Ibn Abdul Hadi, he has a kitab called, Ibn Abdul Hadi is a student of Ibn Taymiyyah. He has a kitab called Tabaqat Ulama Il Hadith. I have it on the shelf. It's the third volume, page 35, 350. Ibn Abdul Hadi said about Ibn Hazm, he said he's Jahmiyun Jalid. He said Jahmi. A hardcore Jahmi. Last but not least, Mu'allimi has another statement in his kitab Al-Ibadah mm. that opposes what he mentions in his kitab Al-Tankil bima fi ta'anib al min al abatil Which one came first? Mu'allimi's kitab Al-Iman, I think it's, uh, kitab Al-Ibadah, I think is one of his last works. Okay. Uh, what did he say then? Could be possibly he's been writing them together shoulder by shoulder. I can't really put my Fine. finger on that. But I know for sure that Kitab al-Ibadah was one of his last works that he wrote. Okay. One of his greatest books that he's written, Rahimahullah ta'ala. In there he mentions, he says, وَهَذَا هُوَ الَّذِي يَدُلُّ عَلَيْهِ سِيَاكُ تِلْكَ الْأَحَادِيثِ وَقَدْ بَيَّنَ فِي بَعْضِ أَنَّ الْمُرَادَ الطَّاعَةُ فِي غَيْرِ مَحْسِيَةِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَقَدْ دَلَّتْ عَلَى ذَلِكَ الْآيَةُ السَّابِقَةِ وَبَيَّنَ فِي بَعْضِ الْأَحَادِيثِ أَنَّ الْخُرُوجَ عَلَى الْأَمِيرِ لَا يَجُوزُ إِلَّا أَن يَكُونَ كُفْرًا بَوَاحًا أَوْ يَتْرُكَ الصَّلَاةَ ثُمَّ قَالَ وَبِالْجُمْلَةِ فَالنَّظَرُ فِي هَذِهِ الْمَسْأَلَةِ مَبْنِيٌّ عَلَى الْأَصْلِ الْإِسْلَامِيِّ الْمَشْهُورِ وَهُوَ أَنَّهُ إِذَا تَعَارَضَتِ الْمَفْسَدَتَانِ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ بُدٌّ مِنْ إِرْتِكَابِ أَحَدِيمَا وَجَبَ إِرْتِكَابُ الصُّغْرَى لِدَرْءِ الْكُبْرَى ما شاء الله this is what we were saying all this time ومن هنا and from here يُعلم عذر أهل السنة بعد القرن الأول في حذر الخروج على السلطان ما دام مسلما فإن التجارب علمتهم أن النتيجة الخروج تكون أعظم فسادا وشرا وضرا مما كان قبله and in other words the going against oppressive Muslim leader is always going to be oppression so it's always going to be مفسدة greater مفسدة is going to come if you go uh, against uh, him so here he's not saying way the مصالح and the مفاسد he's actually saying the مفسدة is connected to go in against mm-hmm. the oppressive Muslim leader. And that's why he said the Ahl Sunnah should be excused. Okay? Because they realized after Tajarib and their experience that the natija, the outcome that comes from Al Khuruj of the Hakim al Zalim is that uh, and uh, is Takunu Adamu Fasadan wa Sharran wa Durran Mima Kana Kablahu that the corruption and the harm and the problems that will come is far greater than his existence. So here is his and he also mentioned in clear terms that it's not permissible to khuruj against the ruler unless you see kufr bawakh or he leaves the salah. And he says this in his kitab al-ibadah which is known raf al ishtibah page 220. Okay. And if someone says that at 10 key came afterwards, does Abdurrahman al-Mu'allimi break the ijma'? It doesn't. And I want to go into some hypothetical scenarios. I want to ask you these questions and I want to hear your responses inshallah. If a Muslim ruler came to your house and attempted to take your wife and child, would you fight back and protect your family? See, as I told you before, Akhi, and these are, you know, Masail Shariya, Masail Ilmiya, we already spoke about what the Sharia believes. That's what really matters. My personal opinion, what I think, what you think personally, and how you would deal in a situation, that's not what makes it Shari or not. This is the truth of the matter. I feel like people take things very personal and they personalize it. And the thing you have to understand is shara'an, what is permissible? And it, what about if I said I wouldn't, I would fight and I would go out and I would rise and I would revolt and I would... Does it, sh- does it change the shara'i ruling? It doesn't. I'm mentioning shara'i rulings. And I'm saying that this was that which is upon us as Muslims to do is what Allah sanctioned and His Messenger. What I would do and what I wouldn't do, that's a personal thing for me personally. It doesn't... It doesn't change the hukum shara'i. Mm-hmm. That's that's what I, I think. We, so all through this, we've been speaking about a a shara'i ruling. Yeah. And what should someone do under that situation? Shara'i ruling. Hey, naam. So a person, as I said to you before, uh, the oppression of a Muslim leader, okay, uh, is that we should be patient and we should we should not uprise against him. We should not uprise against him. And if a person can get their family in a way that they don't have to uprise, mm. get their family back, then shara'an, they can do it. And I, I, I just be, really want to be honest, and 
Like I have not yet seen. I've, have you ever met someone who said that you know my wife and children were taken from me, zulman wa udwana? They came into my house at night time and they took my family. Yeah, and not that I'm saying it doesn't exist, but I'm also saying why do we go to the extreme in order to prove a point that's shara'i, like extremist scenario I bring for you, and then I say look, even you know the situation doesn't happen on a regular basis. It's rare situations you're talking about. And yes. that's something I feel like inshallah ta'ala should be a response to anybody who's smart and is clever. Yep, I think the next one is also going to have a similar response. But this is something that Ibn Khazmin brought in his book Al-Fisal. So I think it does warrant asking, what do you say about a ruler who puts the Jews in charge, makes the Christians his army, forces the Muslims to pay the jizya? That, I mean, that, that, that we just have to, is he a Muslim? <laughs> And is mm. this ruler a Muslim or not is a discussion, not that he is a uh, an oppressive Muslim leader. He's, he goes on to say, um, he, he publicly, so he raises weapons against Muslim children, captures the Muslim women, is publicly perverse with them. And all of that though, he still agrees with Islam outwardly and he continues to pray. So he's trying to give the impression that he's still... I mean, we just that, that, that should be a discussion about yeah. whether he's a Muslim and he's left the religion of Islam. And again, it's not for us. It's for the Ahlul, ahlul Ilm and the Ahlul yeah. Halul Al-Aqdi will determine what his situation is. But this is not a discussion of an oppressive, oppressive Muslim leader. This is actually more than that. It's actually talking about a, uh, a ruler whose Islam uh, can be questioned. Because there's a lot of... Un, I, mean, I don't have a statement memorized or anything. Mm. But there's a lot of things that he said that and he can allude to saying that this leader is not, is he even a Muslim? Again, it's a, yani it's a, um, yani this situation doesn't warrant you doing khuruj on a Muslim leader, right? A Muslim oppressive leader. Taking that situation he mentions and applying that on every single ruler by looking at what Ibn Hazmi here said, he's describing all the rulers. Right, of Islam. right, right, right. Yeah, you know? see, you can't take an extreme scenario just to try and justify everything okay the last one again like i said i apologize but i have to bring everything the last one on this kind of hypothetical scenario is what if there was an ashali government and all of the salafis were gathered in one place of the land and the hakim commands all of the salafis to be killed can they defend themselves well i think this is turrahat i just believe they're turrahat and khuzabalat to be honest i don't mm -hmm. think this is an ilmi response it's not a knowledge-based discussion Arafat. okay if the leader is an ashali he has to be still obeyed and listened to okay he has to be what Mm -hmm. has to be obeyed and listened to and you're not allowed to go against him because he's still a Muslim he has to be listened and obeyed whether he's an Ash'ari or not okay I want to move on now to something that you said previously in one of your videos that if the ruler leaves the Salah this is the only time that we can rebel against him do you believe that the only time you can rebel against a Muslim ruler is if he leaves the Salah remember to me the view that I hold is that leaving the Salah is kufr Correct. so if I say to you that the only time you can do khuruj on him is when he leaves the salah. For me, leaving the salah is a what? It's an act of kufr. Mm. So for me, I'm saying that to you, if he leaves the salah, he's a kafir. And if he does kufr, is when you're only allowed to go against him. Because okay. I explained him being a kafir as what? As leaving the salah. Yeah, you link so, the, the kufr and bawakhan with this. With the salah. Hadith. Yeah. Yeah. So if he leaves the religion in any other way, it's the same. So I just it, mentioned it, one example to explain to you. Okay. If he does istikhlal or istibdal, then it's the same. It's the same thing. He's left. If he makes a religion, if he makes halal for himself, that which yeah. is haram or juhud or takdeeb yeah. or... And I think the hadith that you mentioned at the time of this statement just said the salah. Is that right? Yeah, I said, yeah, just the salah. Meaning, I believe the salah to be kufur akbar. And since I believe the salah to be kufur akbar, any other act that is kufur akbar, like leaving the salah, I also believe that if you go against him, if he, if he comes with it, yeah, it's allowed for the person to go against him. And I mentioned that. Yeah, I think it's another example where uh, it was a misunderstanding and as a result, again, another 45 minute or one hour video was actually made out of this. Whereas if you're having a conversation, you could have just cleared that up. No, I actually believe any time that the leader becomes a kafir, whether it's from the leaving Slaw or otherwise, we can, uh, you can rebel against him. Um, so at least we, we had the opportunity to clear but that you know, up. There's something I seconds. want to add on to that. Every party yeah. believes that if the leader leaves the Salah, that you can go against him. The ones who believe that leaving the Salah doesn't make you a kafir, and merely just by leaving the salah, they believe that you're only allowed to go against the leader when he leaves the salah juhudan, which is ijma. There's no parties differing. Juhudan meaning out of stubbornness. Mm -hmm. It's not just merely just leaving it. So they would say, uh, إلا, when the Prophet ﷺ said, "La illa ma qama fiqum salah," that until he establishes a prayer amongst you, they would say it means that if he leaves the salah juhudan. So then that's when they're going to do, and that's when they're going to see the permissibility of doing khuruj to him.
Whereas I, on the other hand, and those who are of my opinion, would say no, just by merely leaving the salah warrants disbelief, and then his other shurut are going to be looked at to go against him. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Yeah, um, um, that's going to be one of my questions, in fact. So I've got three questions on this. You linked leaving the salah to kufr bawah. How can something have ikhtilaf in it? Because you admit that it's a mas'ala that is a khilafiyah, that leaving the salah, whether it makes you a kafir or not. How can something have ikhtilaf in it and also be clear kufr at the same time? It's a contradiction in terms. Both parties is different for them what is clear kufr. Someone would come and say, it's clear kufr for me, that leaving the salah merely is not what's, what warrants kufr. Okay. In other words, I have many other evidences that prove for me that what's meant by here, leaving the salah, it means leaving it by coming with juhud. With an Albanian, those of his, of his opinion. Kind of like rejecting the salah Rejecting part the obligation, religion, and yeah. etc. So they will say, that's when I believe is kufr. Okay. Whereas the one who believes merely just leaving the salah, mujarrad tark, just by merely leaving it, even if it's out of laziness, that warrants kufr, that person would be doing khuruj before you. Mm. And if you don't believe it's kufr akbar, na, you should be at the back. You're not allowed to do khuruj because you see his, you still see him as a sinner if he's still if he's leaving the prayer. And the way you interpret the hadith that mentions that you can do khuruj if he leaves the salah is if he leaves the salah juhudan because that's what you believe. Yes. So and there's no contradiction does, here. No, it is no contradiction. Okay. How can you accept ikhtilaf in the issue? How can you not accept ikhtilaf in the issue of khuruj when you have already accepted ikhtilaf on the ruling of leaving the salah? And the two masail are so closely linked. Not again. Not necessarily. It goes back to the issue of what is kufr and what is not kufr. The ulama have differed upon it. Some, some issues, ulama have differed. Is this kufr or not? Does that make sense? Mm. So if I believe that leaving the salah merely warrants kufr, then mm. I will go against this leader on the premises what? That he's a? He's a kafir. He's a kafir. Yeah. If you believe, and you're of the opinion that Merely leaving the salah is not kufr akbar. You have to do it with juhud. You're not allowed to do khuruj yet unless you verify did he leave it out of takasal, did he leave it out of juhud. You you can't do khuruj yet. I'm way before you in that mm, regard. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when I say me, I mean I don't personally determine if you can do khuruj or not. There's going to be ahlul hal wal aqda going to look at the shurud and the, the mawani and they're going to look at the, the masalih and the mafasid. They're going to do the nasiha and all of that. It's not my, but I'm saying the scholars who hold my opinion. Arafat? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know. Okay, last question on this. If but, somebody, but that person who believes, that person who believes that you uh, can only become a kafir or leaving the salah if you do it out of juhud. If the leave, le if the leader leaves it out of laziness, yeah. he believes he's a sinner. He doesn't believe he's a kafir. Yeah. So he can't do khuruj. Okay, that's the that's the exact response to my final question. I'm gonna have to ask it anyway because sometimes you have to really uh, drill at home. If somebody believes that leaving the salah is not kufr akbar. Can they rebel against the ruler who leaves the salah because of this hadith that you mentioned? If you say no, you are rejecting this hadith. And if you say yes, then you have conceded it is permissible to rebel against the Muslim no. ruler. I just yeah. said to you that the person who believes leaving the salah merely alone is not kufr akbar. He's not allowed to go against the ruler because he believes he's a what? If he leaves it merely, he's just a sinner. He's not kufr akbar. He hasn't come with kufr akbar yet. Yeah, if the person who believes that leaving the salah is not kufr akbar, as in leaving the salah of laziness, for example, is not kufr akbar. Yeah. Then he, when the ruler leaves, if he sees the ruler leaving salah, he can't just go against him. Because he says he's a sinner. He's, he's a, a sinner. He he's still a Muslim. He's a Muslim but to you. if he believes that it is kufr akbar, then in that situation he can. And the one who believes that it's just a sin, then if he verifies that the leaver has left out of juhud, he's saying it's not part of the deen, so then it becomes kufr akbar, and that's when the hadith comes into play. So you have to really take narrations all together. You can't just look at one narration or take one snippet out of a video and say, this is what was said, and this narration just said, leaves in the salah. What about the other hadith that says kufr bawa khaniyat? Because I asked that same person, I said, look bro, you just said to me that you don't believe kufr, tariq salah is kufr akbar, mujarrad tariq salah is not kufr akbar, hmm. merely just leaving the salah. You'll say, yes, I don't. So you believe this leader is oppressive and he's just a, he's a Muslim but he's an oppressive, tyrannical leader. Yes. So you're not allowed to do khuruj. Because all the other hadith come on top of you. Ah, all the hadith of being patient with him. Yeah. But this other brother is saying, I don't believe he's a Muslim anymore because he left the salah and it's clear and I advised him and I'm in Ahlul Hal wal Aqd and I advised him and I told him, I don't believe him to be a Muslim anymore. That individual, okay, that individual is what? That individual, he's going on him on the grounds, not that he's an oppressive Muslim leader. That is a kafir. That is a kafir and he's using Tarku Salah as evidence. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Okay, uh, last section I've got before I go some closing questions for you and then I'll give you a chance to summarize the, the very lengthy discussion that we've had. Um, the Salaf didn't like sitting with the rulers. And I mentioned this hadith earlier as well, or this is another one actually. The Prophet said, whoever resides in the desert, he becomes ignorant. 
and whoever follows the game, he becomes heedless. And whoever comes to the doors of the rulers, he will suffer a fitna. Mm. He also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there will be leaders, you will recognize them and you will dislike them. I mentioned this before. Whoever opposes them will be successful and whoever stays away from them will be safe. And anyone who mixes with them will be destroyed. And there are many athar from the, uh, athar from the Salaf, from Sufyan Athari, for example, and other than him, that talk about how they don't even like people sitting with or even visiting the rulers, and some of them even went as far as linking this issue to falling into innovation. Do any of these narrations contradict what you've been saying about obeying the Muslim no. rule or doing khuruj? No, not at all. Yeah, I mean, not sitting with the leader and avoiding going to enter the houses of their leaders is nothing to do with khuruj. Mm. يعني, the <laughs> Salaf, they differed amongst themselves when it came to the issue of the leaders. Some of them were close to the leaders, like uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, Marwan, uh, sorry, uh, uh, and, um, Maymur ibn Mehran. He was a writer for Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Mm. So, uh, uh, Al Qadi Abu Yusuf was a Qadi Qudat for what do you call it, Harun al Rashid. Yani some were like that, some were in high positions. And Qadi Qudat, by the way, is today equal to the Ministry of Justice. Okay. So some of them, some of them occupied high seats, high positions in the government. Okay. Mm. And a lot of scholars did not like they going to enter the leaders. Uh, and Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, it was mentioned that he avoided eating the food of his son, yani Salih, mm. because of the fact that he used to take money from the government and he used to be part of the government. So he never used to take his risk. But that's the same Imam Ahmed who said that it's not permissible to, to do, do khuruj. Khuruj against rules and whoever does so Aynam. is an innovator. Aynam. And some scholars, whenever the leader would call them or even come, they would go. They would avoid it and not do it. And even in our time, some scholars did that. Like Abdur, For example, Abdurrahman ibn Nasir Su'di rahimahullahu ta'ala. For example, the king one time visited him in Qasim and he avoided it and he left. He left and avoided him. And some people are like that. You know, they avoid the leader. They don't go to him. But they tell the people to listen and obey and not go against him and a oppressive leader. But, yani, whether you want to visit him, if you don't want to visit him, if you're, you know, you're scared for your deen, that's your wara and your, yeah. your, de- your deen. And uh, it's an honorable thing, to be honest, not to enter the doors of the leaders. And part, yeah. by the way, I spoke about that in my lecture on the issue of the middle path. I mm, mentioned in right. a, a section of when it comes to the leaders, not to enter upon the leaders and to avoid that. And I put that into today the people who speak about politics and who are politicians who in the UK government and system and, and you know MP of this and MP of that and running for offices in the government. And if that's been said about Muslim leaders, what do you think about the non-Muslims? Okay, 100% Barakallah Feek. I'm just going to go on some closing questions like we normally do on the hot seat. And then I'll give you a chance to summarize the discussion. I'll also add a summary of my own inshallah ta'ala. Uh, who is the one who is fit to be talking about these kind of issues, these kind of big issues? You brought many different sciences of Islam to kind of understand these narrations. What is the kind of like level of knowledge that is required for someone to be talking about these things? Well, like these issues are big issues. Yani, they're not a light issue. They're msail, idham, they're blood, they're safety, issues of safety. They're talking about يعني وإذا جاءهم أمر من الأمن أو الخوف أذاعوا به ولو ردوا إلى الرسول وإلى أولي الأمر منهم لعلمه الذين يستنبطونه منهم It's issues of safety يعني what's going to happen is that you're going to give fatwa that it's permissible or it's if it's a feeling to do khuruj and a person might be inspired by that and, 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 and go and uprise in their country mm-hmm. and the bloodshed and everything that happens is on your neck يوم القيامة it's on your neck يوم القيامة mm-hmm. you're causing disunity discord bloodshed Havoc, anarchy in a land, you need to remember you're going to stand in front of Allah Yom Al Qiyamah. And uh, we're living at that time when we're seeing, as the Prophet told us, alayhi salam, in Hadith Sahihain, in Hadith Abdiyam and Abr Mas, he said, In Allah, you know, 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 People who have no knowledge, no understanding of the religion, can't read a paragraph, struggling in reading. They don't know the Quran. They haven't memorized even Juz Amma. The Khutbah al Hajjah cannot be pronounced properly on their side. Even when they uh, speak about the religion, a child, a little kid can see the big flaws and the mistakes that are in this person. And they're not just talking about any issue in the religion, which they usl and can't even, but they're talking about Masail or Urda ala Abi Bakrin wa Umar. If these masail were presented to Umar and Abi Bakr, يعني, they would have called the people of Badr for this and say, what do you guys think? What should we do in this matter? 
Umar and Abu Bakr will never just answer it by themselves. But these people, they talk about those issues like it's. And the poet, he said, وَالْكُلُّ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَنَاحِ الْأَرْبَاحِ يَقُولُ لَا أَدْرِي فَكُنْ مُتَّبِعَةً the, the great imams of Islam, Abu, Abu Hanifa, Al-Imam Malik, and Al-Imam Shafi and Ahmed, all of them, they used to run away from this concept of يعني, answering everything and speaking about everything. They used to try to avoid it. And they used to say, لَا أَدْرِي uh, I don't know. لَا أَدْرِي I don't know. They used to avoid speaking about the issues of the religion. Allah tells us in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ إن السمع والبصر والفؤاد كل أولئك كان عنه مسؤولا. Don't speak about what you have no knowledge of. Allah says ولا تقول لما لما تصف على سنتكم الكذب هذا حلال وهذا حرام لتفتر على الله الكذب. إن الذين يفترون على الله الكذب لا يفلحون. They won't find success with Allah in this world or the hereafter. Speaking about this halal and haram. I don't believe many people who are talking about these issues should even be should should be even speaking about issues of tahara. They shouldn't even be even speaking about issues of tahara. Let alone issues of salah. And zakat and sawm and hajj. They should not be talking about even the ahkam and uh, um, aqsamul miyah, the types of water. Um, ma, ma bihi. They shouldn't be talking about that. They should not be talking about yani mm-hmm. They should not be talking about al masuh al khufain. They shouldn't be talking about these issues, let alone issues of khuruj, issues of imama and al wilaya. They shouldn't be talking about those issues. And this really is, as I said to you before, يعني it is يعني a person who would do this is a person who hasn't taken knowledge from its right place. He will be deceived by his own self and his, uh, those other people are going to deceive him. And I think, to be honest, what's happening now and what we're seeing what's taking place, there's a big agenda behind all of this. It's not just as we see it from the outer. There's something, it's an agenda. And I believe I am not more passionate about this religion and I am not, I don't have more ghira for this deen than Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah will protect his religion. Allah is one who's going to give his religion. And Allah wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, The filthy things will go, inshallah ta'ala, will perish. And what will remain is that which is beneficial for the ummah. Well, I, before we saw Evil people come. Where are they now? Mm. Many corrupt people came through Islamic history. Where are they? Where are they to be named? Today, if you hear about the Jahmiyyah, you're not. There's no book they've written. They mentioned in the refutation of the Ahl Sunnah, and that's the same that's going to happen. Everybody who comes after, who tries to play with this Dawah, Dawah to Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Allah wa Taala is going to take it upon Himself to destroy them. And I also believe يحمل هذا العلم من كل خلف عدوله ينفون عنه تحريف الغالين وانتحار المبطلين وتأويل الجاهلين. That there's always going to be people who are going to stand up to defend the religion. They're going to defend it from the distortion of those who want to distort it and those who want to tamper with it and play with it. There's always going to be a people, inshallah. As the Prophet told us لا تزال طائفة من أمتي ظاهرين على الحق لا يضرهم من خذلهم ولا من خالفهم حتى يأتي أمر الله ومعنى ذلك. So I'm not too worried in that regard, inshallah ta'ala, upon me and all the other brothers and everybody upon the da'wah. It's just to exert the effort and hard work mm-hmm. and everything that's hidden from our eyes and that we can't see and who's really doing this and who's playing with this. All of it will become clear. The Arabs, they say, إِذَا جَلَ الْغُبَارُ When the dust goes down in the battlefield, you will realize, عَرَفْتَ تَحْتَكَ فَرَسٌ أَمْ حِمَارٌ You will know what you're sitting on. Are you sitting on a horse? Huh? Or are you sitting on a donkey? When the mm-hmm. dust goes down, we all know what, what's what. And they also say, Daytime you will learn, min, min man baka, the one who cried, and man baka min man tabaka, the one who cried, yeah, and the one who's pretending to cry. Mm-hmm. You know, when the light comes on, you can see, okay, you're lying. This one's genuine crying. So inshallah ta'ala, when Allah tabarak ta'ala, bin uh, kareem, chooses to bring the deen to 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 uh, to light the falsehood inshallah ta'ala will go inshallah qul ja'a al-haqq wa zahaqa al-batil inna al-batil kana zahuqa do you love the oppressive muslim rulers and do you approve of their actions just because you... i don't that's why we keep saying at the beginning we dislike it we hate it i hate it of course i hate it i don't like to see any muslim being oppressed and wronged mm-hmm. no one would love oppression the prophet told us in the hadith inna al- يا عبادي إني حرمت الظلم على نفسي وجعلته بينكم محرما فلا تظلموا. Allah made the ظلم oppression 
haram from himself subhanahu wa ta'ala and he made it haram amongst the creation no one's gonna who's gonna like oppression yeah. Yeah. what do you say about the one who claims that you actually have a hidden agenda and you don't really care about these ahadith and athar rather it's all about loving and protecting the rulers of Saudi Arabia because of the najdi da'wah that came from that region wallahi that's a a answer that a person has to prepare for yawm al-qiyamah if they can stick to that when I, when we all stand in front of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala the scholars they say wa ila Allah tajtami'u al-khusum the disputes and argumentations will be brought to Allah yawm al-qiyamah and Allah tabarak wa ta'ala will judge between his creation subhanahu wa ta'ala wallahi my answer is for every government every government in the muslim world every country every leader who's a muslim uh, is the leader of his country he should be heard and obeyed I'm not defending any particular country. I'm not. <clears throat> it's not Saudi I'm speaking for. It's not Turkey I'm speaking for. It's not Qatar I'm speaking for. It's not UAE I'm here. In this country I'm here. I'm speaking about every Muslim country. We must listen and obey the uh, as long as they are Muslims. Okay, and I don't see how they're kufar. So we need to listen and obey them. We need to beg Allah wa ta'ala to rectify their situation. And we beg Allah wa ta'ala to rectify their situation and make matters better for us wherever we are, wherever Muslims are in the Muslim world. Like in to say that all of this is directed for one particular country is kadib. Maybe that person has come across somebody else that, that, that feels that way or is like that. But for me, that's not the case. Okay. Final question. If I'm going to ask you to summarize the uh, the lengthy discussion we've had on this particular topic after hearing all of the hadith and the narrations that you've mentioned over the last few hours do you think anybody can call themselves Athari or Salafi and still hold on to the belief that there is a valid difference of opinion no, no, on this issue? All. Not at all No, not at all You can't call yourself Athari and go against the Athar as Imam Muhammad said يعني, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a false Yani name you're giving to yourself You attribute yourself to That which you're not really To be honest Okay uh, Why don't we close the discussion By maybe you adding a summary uh, I know it's been a very Very lengthy discussion But add a summary Of what you can You want to bring forward From it, the main points Or the main argument And then I'll also summarize it On my end as well And we can close the podcast Inshallah you do I've said everything I needed to say in this issue I don't think I've left okay. I think for me That anything. I just want to remind The Muslims that are watching this And listening to this that we take our religion from the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the Ijma'ah. And this particular issue, you brought Dalil, many Adila, from the Qur'an, from the Sunnah. And within the Sunnah, it's not just random books from the Sunnah, it's Bukhari and Muslim, predominantly the Sahih of Imam Muslim, which is the second most authentic book after Imam Bukhari in terms of the books of, of Hadith. So you have the Qur'an, you have the Sunnah, and you have an Ijma'ah. And Ijma' you brought forward, and of course you, previously in the discussion, you spoke about the proofs for why Ijma' is binding upon us. The Ijma' that you brought is not just any old Ijma'. It's an Ijma' of the companions. Now you have an issue where you have Qur'an, Sunnah, Ijma' of the companions. I don't understand how you can possibly get anything clearer than that. I know what confuses it for a lot of people. Two things. Number one is the ikhtilaf that came with the Salaf. And... There's a the, sorry the 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 the, the khuruj that the people did from the salaf. After that is another ijma. So even that khuruj or even that ikhtilaf that occurred, it's sandwiched in between two ijmas, and each one of those ijmas are actually two ijmas. One of them is that we're not allowed to do khuruj against a Muslim ruler, and the second one is that if there's two evils, we don't take the the, the one that's going to cause greater harm. And khuruj is one of those issues where it will cause a greater harm. Except for maybe a, a nadir situation, a, a rare situation, but of course we don't make rulings based on that. So for anybody who's watching this really, when you have an issue in the religion where you have Qur'an, Sunnah, Ijma' of the companions, and in the, another Ijma' afterwards, and you mentioned 33 names I believe, mm -hmm. from them Imam Bukhari, Imam Ahmed, Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Nawawi, these are big household names that people have heard of many, many times. Even the layman Muslims have heard of these names. And these imams did not transmit the view that you should not do khuruj. Rather, they transmitted a consensus saying that it's unanimously agreed by the scholars that you do not do khuruj. For someone to hear this and for it to be broken down like this, to still cling on to a difference of opinion 
I'm struggling to find excuses for them. And to be honest with you, it doesn't surprise me because I think we live in a time where people are claiming that making dua to other than Allah is not shirk. There's a difference of opinion whether it's shirk or just haram. And you know, you have difference of opinion in music and all of these issues. And I believe this issue of khuruj goes into the same bucket as all of these uh, these issues. To claim a difference of opinion on this when you've got Quran, Sunnah, Ijma' of the companions and Ijma' of the scholars that came after as well, I don't understand how that's, that's, that's possible. What I have seen from the other side, and like I said, I did a lot of research in outside in preparation for this podcast. What I have seen is misunderstanding a fundamental issue and building an argument on top of that. For example, when we looked at Hussein and Ibn Zubair, misunderstanding that they're part of Ahlul Khali wal Aqd, misunderstanding that the Khilaf of Yazid was not complete Khilaf over all the lands, misunderstanding all of these issues and then building a, a lengthy argument based on that misunderstanding and as I said before I genuinely don't believe and from my husband I don't believe that it's something that's done intentionally there are things that I've seen that have worried me but as a whole I don't believe it's done intentionally I just genuinely believe it's done through ignorance but as we said before whether it's done through ignorance or intentionally they both <laughs> Yeah, they're both as bad as each other. Um, and the end result is going to be the same. If you listen to these people, you're going to get misguided. Whether they're intentionally misguiding you or whether they're accidentally misguiding you, it's going to be the same end result for you. So I think that's the other thing that I've seen from the other side really is quoting books, no Quran, no Sunnah, or barely any Sunnah, quoting books. And even these books, it shocked me. I'll be honest with you, it honestly shocked me because I didn't know what you're going to say today on the pod- on the podcast. It shocked me when you bought Ijma' from Imam Nawi. It shocked me when you bought Ijma' from Harbal Kima- uh, Kilmani. Ibn Abdul Bar, was that in your names or Ijma'? Mm-hmm. It shocked me because these are the same people that these guys, that I've, the research that I did, they're mentioning these people's books and they're taking their statements. And to take a statement from these books to try and prove a khilaf from the Imam who transmitted an Ijma' again, Deception, I'm not going to say that, but ignorance for sure. It's just, it, it, it is, uh, it's worrying, it's worrying. It's worrying times we live in, which is why we decided that this issue needs to be dealt with properly. And we've set, spent a long time now, and it's the first time in one video that people can see every single thing related to this issue, both sides of the argument. And you've not just given one response to most questions I've asked, to be fair. You've given three, four different responses. And the reason why we did that is because we wanted to cover everything. We wanted to take all of their statements, bring it to the table and respond to them. And I don't think that this requires any more from us unless unless the other side or someone else brings a response for everything you've said today on this podcast. All the ijma'at that you've brought, the Qur'an, the sunnah, the responses, the different answers that you've given. Every sta- statement of yours, just like we responded to every statement of theirs, if every statement of yours is responded to, then I think it's worth us having another look and seeing what they have got to say. But until that happens, I don't think it's worth us doing anything more. And for the genuine people out there who might still have questions, I'm happy to share our, our email address. As long as the condition is you've watched the podcast all the way through from beginning to end, if you still have questions, you can email us at questions at amau.org. And the final piece of advice is for those people at home, people who genuinely want to know the truth. This is the video that lays it all out for you. Now it's upon you to seek beneficial knowledge because doubts are always going to come from different people. But if you knew what an ijma' is, for example, and you knew how heavy that is in the religion, as soon as you hear an ijma' from Imam Bukhari, for example, it doesn't matter what doubts are going to come to you. It just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me because Imam Bukhari could not transmit an ijma' if this doubt, these many doubts existed. But when you don't have a foundation in your knowledge, what happens is you tend to go right, left, go with the wind. And that's a, that's a huge problem. So my recommendation to myself, first and foremost, before anybody else watching, is to focus on seeking beneficial knowledge because we live in a in a time where things are a little bit crazy, <laughs> in all honesty. A little bit? A little bit crazy. A little all, bit? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> very, very crazy, especially when you look online. And that was another thing that I did as part of my research. I don't have a Twitter account, but I actually looked online and for the first time I actually read through Twitter and read some of these tweets and it really shocked me. Um, it really, really shocked me that some of the statements that are being said, some of the misguidance that's being portrayed out there, and even some of the kind of language and the, the, t- the terms are being used. And uh, my final advice is for people to fear Allah what they say online. 
just like you do, you're going to be held accountable for what comes out of your mouth. You're also going to be held accountable for what comes from your thumbs when you're typing online. And it's very dangerous to stay a statement to one person, let alone on Twitter, and then it gets retweeted and shared and thousands of people view that same statement. So that's kind of how I'd like to summarize it. Uh, I don't know if you want to add anything on top of that. If not, we'll close this very, very lengthy podcast. And the last thing I'll say on behalf of the people, Jazakallah khair for your time. I have mentioned it during the podcast that it takes two seconds to vomit, but it takes an hour to clean up the mess. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've had to do. And it's really been you who's been there. <coughs> no, you, mashallah, Jazakallah khair no, for collecting all the shubhas. So, uh, so I think, uh, I think for, it to our for, the, like for the time you put into this, not um, behind scenes research and also bringing it to the PN. Obviously, you'd, I don't know how you've done the talking because my, my mouth is dry and I've not done like half the talking that you've done. So um, on behalf of the people, we want to thank you. We want to thank you always for the, for the, the, the with the permission of Allah, helping the Ummah. I, I think honestly, you and other brothers working uh, behind, the, behind the scenes who are recording, who are editing, who are putting it together, Akhi, it's, it's, a, it's a joint effort. Akhi, it's a, it, there's no doubt it's a team effort. It's a team yeah, effort. No, no, no doubt about that. Um, but there's a special thanks that goes out to you on behalf of the people. So I want to keep that there, inshallah. Um, without any further ado, we'll close the podcast. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu wa la ilaha la ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.